Bene, ancora benvenuti a tutti a questa seconda giornata di Beyond Our Collections ed è un grandissimo piacere presentare la eh, professoressa Maria Elisa Micheli dell'Università degli Studi Carlo Bodi Urbino che sarà il presidente di sessione per questa, per questa prima parte fino alla pausa caffè. E quindi cedo la parola a, alla professoressa. E... Grazie, buongiorno e grazie a tutti, in particolare a... agli organizzatori del, di questo convegno molto interessante per, per l'invito. E come si dice, it's a pleasure and honor to, for me to be here today. But I prefer speaking in Italian, sorry. Thank you very much. <ride> e questo è il primo punto. Così, ehm, insomma, credo che imparerò molte cose sentendo, per cui presento subito la prima uh, speaker, Eva Falaschi, grazie, che eh, della Scuola Normale Superiore di Pisa, quindi come si dice gioca in casa, grazie, <ride> e siccome credo che abbia già, si sia già occupata di questo tema in diversi lavori, è un piacere ascoltarla in Sunagon Caictomenos, arato di Sicione e il suo interesse per l'arte secondo la prospettiva di Plutarco. Ri per favore grazie, ricordo solo una volta di contenere in una half an hour, in una mezz'ora gli interventi, grazie. Grazie mille, buongiorno a tutti, mi sentite? Forse adesso meglio? Ok. Eh, sì, innanzitutto permettetemi di ringraziare gli organizzatori del convegno, Gabriella, Gianfranco, Walter, per aver ideato e realizzato queste giornate di, di studio e per l'invito a prendere parte. When I first thought at this presentation, I imagined to begin with a question. Then I decided to start from Plutarch. <laughs> In his life of Eretus, he describes the liberation of Sicion from the tyrant Nicocles in 251 BC. Eretus was the leader of these political changes. After the defeat of tyranny, many citizens who had been exiled by Nicocles came back home and began asking to get back their properties. Since Eretus was afraid that this situation could lead to a civil war, he decided to ask Ptolemy II for help and went to Egypt. In your handout, you can find Plutarch's text in Perrin's translation. From Caria, after a long time, he made his way across Egypt and found the king both naturally well disposed towards him and much grat gratified because Eretus had sent him drawings and paintings from Greece. In these matters, Eretus had a refined judgment and was continually collecting and acquiring works of artistic skill and e excellence, especially those of Pamphilus and Melentus. This he would send to Ptolemy. For the fame of Sicians refined and beautiful paintings was still in full bloom, and they alone were thought to have a beauty that was indestructible. Therefore, even the great Apelles, when he was already admired, came to Sicion and gave a talent that it might be admitted into the society of its artists, desiring to share their fame rather than their heart. Hence, it was that Eretus, although he at once destroyed the other portraits of the tyrants when he had given the city its freedom, deliberated a long time about that of Eristratus, who flourished in the time of P Philip of Macedon. For it was the work of Melantus and all his pupils, and Eristratus was painted standing by a chariot in which was a victory. A palace also had a hand in the, in the painting, uh, as we are told by Polemon, the topographer, and the work was a marvelous one, so that Eratus was moved by the artistic skill therein. 
But afterwards, such was his hatred of the tyrants that he ordered it to be removed and destroyed. Accordingly, the painter Nialsis, who was a friend of Eretus, interceded with him for the picture, as we are told, and with tears, and when he could not uh, persuade him, said that uh, war should, um, should we wage against the tyrants, but not against the treasures of the tyrants. Let us therefore leave the chariot and the victory, but Aristotle himself I will undertake to remove from the picture. Eretos therefore yielded, and Nialsis erased the figure of Aristotle and in its place painted a palm tree merely, not daring to introduce anything else. We are told, however, that the feet of the erased figure of Aristotle uh, were left by an oversight beneath the chariot. In consequence of this love of art, Eretus was already beloved by the king, and in personal intercourse grew yet more upon, upon him and received for, the, for his city a gift of a hundred and fifty talents. The structure of the peace passage is well organized and inserted in the historical narration of the life of Eretus. Moving from the sending of some paintings to Ptolemy II and the good effects it had on the Egyptian king, Plutarch celebrate, celebrates Eretus' sophisticated connoisseurship of Sicionian painting. It gives the opportunity for a brief digression on the greatness of Sicionian painting itself. This digression is necessary to explain how Eretus could have become an expert of painting. He grew up in the cradle of art, and to justify his behavior after Nicocles' downfall. From that digression, Plutarch returns back to Eretus and his passion for art. He narrates how Eretus decided to spare the portrait of the tyrant Aristotus by Melanthius. The passage ends. The passage ends with the ring composition, going back to the historical narration and how Ptolemy was pleased with Eretus' gift. Thank also, thanks also to those paintings, he succeeded in getting the money he wanted from Ptolemy. Plutarch depicts a portrait of Eretus as an expert of art. If we look closer at his text, he says that Eretus had a refined judgment and was continually collecting and acquiring works of artistic skill and excellence, especially those of Pamphilus and Melanthius. Crisin and Synagon Kai Ktomenus are the key words he uses to describe Eretus' attitude towards art. <clears throat> he had the right knowledge to recognize good artworks and loved literary collecting, putting together Sunagain, but also owing them. Moreover, Plutarch states that only his hate against tyranny was stronger than his passion for painting. In Plutarch's perspective, and in general, in the perspective of the ancient times, this is a very strong assertion. Plutarch himself, in his life of Eretus, repeats many times how deep was Eretus' hate towards tyranny. In other words, the comparison of fondness for art with hate against tyranny reveals the importance of this issue. At least in Plutarch's thoughts, it is not a superfluous appendix in the characterization of Eretus as a politician and a man, but it is a real part of his personality and the reason of appreciating him. 
But Reto's is not only uh, is not the only estimator of art in this narration. Another figure emerges as a great lover of Sicconian painting, Ptolemy II. His fondness for art is described almost as a weakness which Eretus tried to take advantage of and with success. Plutarch wrote his life of Eretus between the end of the first century AD and the beginning of the second century AD. He refers events which took place at the middle of the third century BC in a political, historical, and cultural context which was very far from that one he lived in. For this reason, it is licit and necessary to wonder to what extent his description of Eretus and, Pod um, and Pod Ptolemy also could be reliable, and on the contrary, how much his portrait corresponds to an idea of collector and connoisseur of art which was common in the imperial age, if a distinction is licit. For example, we could evaluate the whole coherence of his portraits. In all his life of Eretus, Plutarch, Plutarch is worried to underline Eretus' relationships with Sicconian artists of his times. We learn, we learn that Timanthes depicted his defeat of the Italians at Pellini in 241 BC. This painter is usually identified with the figure of the same name who went to Egypt with Eretus in 251 BC. Since Eretus wanted to gain Ptolemy's favor by giving him Sicconian paintings, it would have been a good move to bring an artist with him. It is also possible that um, Nesitius, who took part in the liberation of Sicon, was the painter mentioned by Pliny. Moreover, when Plutarch tells about Nialsis and his attempt to spare Milensius' painting with Aristratius, he introduces Nialsis as a friend of Aretus. We can conclude that Plutarch's portrait of Eretus is with coherence the portrait of a well-educated, highly placed man with many relationships with artists of his times. On the other side, Plutarch also depicts a scene where artists take an active part in the political events of the city and, thanks to the value of, of their art, have power to determine some decisions. Out of Plutarch's narration, we only know from Pliny that the painter Leontiscus depicted Aratus as a winner with a trophy, but some scholars do not agree to identify this Aratus with the Sicconian politician. If we turn now to Ptolemy, a a confirmation of his fondness for Sicconian painting could be found in Ateneus. According to him and his sources, Calixinus of Rhodes, the pavilion built in the occasion of Ptolemy's great procession was decorated also with Sicconian paintings, together with portraits, embroidered garments, statues, weapons, and media, many other artworks. It seems to support the idea that Tereto's political move of gaining Ptolemy's favor by paintings was well justified. We do not really have any reason to think that Plutarch's portraits of Eretus and Ptolemy are wrong. Literary and epigraphical sources, as, uh, as well as uh, the archaeological evidence, confirm the great interest that in the Hellenistic age, kings and political figures showed towards art, so that Plutarch's description appears realistic for that time, as far as we know it. Nonetheless, a doubt could arise if we take in consideration the influence on this historical narration of the idea of Sicconian art, which was widespread in the imperial age. Sicon was considered the cradle of Greek art. 
the place where painting, sculpture and every other art flourished, as Treble refers, while Pliny defines this city, Patria Picture. According to him, it was even more than that. It was the place where well-educated people began studying painting. It matches very well with Plutarch's portrait of Eretus and can explain where Eretus got his artistic knowledge. At this point, a question arises. How much Plutarch's portrait of Eretus as a connoisseur of art is influenced by the fame of Sicionian art itself, that is, from the history of art, which was known in the Imperial Age? When he wrote the chapters dedicated to Eretus' fondness for art, Plutarch cannot avoid to celebrate Sicionian painting. He says that the fame of Sicion's muse and beautiful painting was still in full bloom, and it alone was thought to have a beauty that was indestructible. Cristografia is a apax legomenon, which Plutarch probably uses and maybe creates to distinguish the concept of beautiful painting from that one of beautiful writing, calligraphia. Moreover, since it does not exist a muse of painting, the allusion to the Sicionian muse seems to indicate Plutarch's interest in depicting Sicion in general as a cradle of culture. But Sicion was famous for art, not for literature or theater or philosophy, so that we have the impression that Plutarch intends to recognize to Sicionian painting a place among muses, that is, in the educational and cultural system of his own times and or of Eretus' times. Plutarch's terminology and the concepts he expresses in these lines are not technical. The celebration of painting seems more a rhetorical product than the allusion to practical or theoretical aspects of art. Nonetheless, Plutarch's evaluation is based on the clear idea of the existence of a Sicionian painting tradition. Moreover, it implies the conception of a development of painting. Ante Yeti, in fact, suggests that at the times of Eretus, Sicionian painting had an ancient tradition, while after that period it declined. Osmones adiaphtoron ecuses tocalon, instead, seems to indicate that in the 3rd century BC other schools had declined. It could be an allusion to Attic school, but also to the new division of schools proposed from one of the most eminent exponents of Sicionian school, uh, Eupompus. He distinguished three schools, Ionicum, Sicionium, and Atticum, while before that only two were recognized, Eladicum and Asiaticum. That is, Eupompus divided Eladicum in two different schools, Sicionium and Atticum. In conclusion, we can say that even if Plutarch's celebration of Sicionian painting appears a rhetorical elaboration, we cannot exclude that he was influenced by artistic theories and knowledge common at his time. Also, a palace mention speaks in this direction. On one side, it seems a rhetorical motive to say even the greatest painter went to Sicher in order to benefit of its fame. On the other, this piece of news is confirmed by Pliny, who states that he was a pupil of Pamphilus of Amphipolis, together with Melentius. Plutarch, indeed, does not state that Apelles went to Sicher to learn painting. But he says that he arrived there when he was already famous, just because he wanted to link his name to that school and benefit of its fame. Therefore, we could wonder if even this, in this detail, his elaboration of the information was influenced by the, by the fame of Sicionian painting in his times. 
Now I would like to go back to the question I had in mind at the beginning, and which has meanwhile become more than one question. If we would like to use such a literary source as Plutarch's passage on Aratus' fondness towards art, in order to discuss on art collecting in ancient times, which problems, limits, and challenges should we face? Which method, method should we apply? How can Plutarch's information properly be used? I have the impression that, at least in the case of literary sources, our attempt to understand the phenomenon of art collecting in ancient times faces not only the problem of using later and modern categories, definitions, and dynamics, but also that one of considering the categories, the definition, and the dynamics which characterize the epoch which the source is dated to. As we have seen in the case of Eretus and Plutarch, historical data, data on Eretus' personality and the events he led strictly intertwine with and overlap the artistic fame which embraced Sichon and his painting school in the imperial age, so that it is impossible to define the boundaries. In conclusion, Plutarch's portrait of Eretus as a collector and owner of artworks perfectly matches with the fame of Sichonian art in the imperial age. As Pliny confirms, the artists of this school were so famous that collecting their artworks and try to save them from the hate towards ty ty tyranny should appear in Plutarch's perspective, a choice worth mentioning. One of the most interesting aspects of Plutarch's narration is maybe to realize how the clear conception of a history of art and the appreciation of past Greek painting act in it, so that we can perceive the admiration of a collector, is, if I can use this term, an owner and estimator of painting, Plutarch, towards another ancient collector, owner, and estimator of paintings, Eretus. Thank you. Allora, grazie molte, anche perché è interessante aver presentato Arato di Sicione secondo questa prospettiva legandola appunto a una piccola nota del suo ritratto e sarebbe interessante anche una curiosità, il corrispettivo del parallelo della vita romana per capire se ci... ma questo è altro aspetto e comunque interessante anche il, al di là a mio avviso ma poi sarà una discussione magari che interesserà tutti successivamente della lista dei grandi maestri Sicioni, aver anche individuato un lessico pensato per, per questo, forse in un caso, non so. Domande dopo, eh, se, se mi posso permettere. Grazie, possiamo discutere in un, uh, alla fine degli interventi, per cui preferirei chiamare Peter Stewart. Grazie. Dell'Università di Oxford, che è anche conosciuto, o almeno per me, per un suo lavoro sulle statue romane, nella società romana, e, e quindi è un piacere ascoltare adesso uh, <laughs> Did Romans Collect Art e il problema, and the problem of private collection and connoisseurship. In Rome, I suppose. Grazie. Thank you very much. And uh, well, I guess the answer to my question is yes, Romans did collect art. I, let, me, <laughs> let me reassure you that I, in the middle of a, a conference largely devoted to Roman collecting, I'm not going to suggest really that it didn't exist. I'm also not going to attempt a very firm definition of connoisseurship uh, after yesterday's discussion. But what I do want to do is examine some of the evidence for collecting in the Roman private sphere to try and bring out a little bit of the nuance uh, of the sources uh, and to ask what kind of collecting emerges from those sources, uh, which we have perhaps sometimes been too inclined to see 
uh, to lump together as evidence for a single phenomenon. More specifically, I want to question how much the systematic acquisition of works of art in the spirit of a modern art collector applies to Roman antiquity and to what sorts of art objects it might apply. Uh, and I'm thinking here about the modern impression of collectors going out and acquiring works in a particular category uh, to build up a collection for its own sake. I don't want to be more precise than that in defining the kind of practice that I'm talking about, but rather to let the evidence uh, speak for itself a little bit. My starting point is a perhaps unsurprising discrepancy. As we've already heard, Roman literary sources provide abundant evidence for practices similar to collecting in the modern world. We hear about art appreciation on the part of wealthy, educated Romans. Uh, we're told that they acquired works of art, whether antiques or new works in a Greek tradition, uh, and including perhaps replicas of famous works, though that's a controversial topic. The Hellenized tastes of the Roman elite were shaped in the last two centuries of the Roman Republic, in the last two centuries BC, at the time of Rome's political and military implication in the Hellenistic East and in Greek Sicily. And finally, of course, Roman properties, houses and villas, were full of works of art, as we know from excavations and historic finds in Italy and throughout the empire. But from the archaeological evidence, we have little that can safely be correlated either with the self-conscious collecting practices of the Romans as implied or described by ancient literature, or with the serial acquisitiveness of the modern collector. We have, of course, innumerable examples of sculpture as an essential part of the decor of Roman houses. But to a large extent, this is decor in a Roman sense. It's involved in the construction of the appropriate environment for the refined Roman's life and activities, as many scholars uh, have argued. And indeed, as we see famously in Cicero's letters in the first century BC, in which he puts on display his erudite judgments about what kinds of sculptures will be appropriate for particular parts of his villa, and sometimes in quite forthright terms. I'm not going to go into detail about the few passages that I show you, but I couldn't resist putting up this slightly loose translation, uh, but one that perhaps captures some of the spirit of Cicero's letters in which he's talking to his correspondents about the acquisition of artworks for his, uh, for his, uh, his villas. Um, and uh, uh, for example, uh, where the hell am I supposed to put statues of Bacchants? Yes, they're beautiful, as you say. I know the type well, and I've seen them before, but I would have explicitly commissioned statues of a specific familiar type if I'd wanted that. What I usually buy are statues I can decorate my palaestra with, the way someone usually decorates a space dedicated to philosophical discussions, uh, and so on. What we don't have is a clear, clear evidence for a collector's mentality in the accumulation of works of art. We don't have evidence of an interest in, in collecting works of art for the sake of collecting um, in passages such as this. Um, now, as far as the archaeology is concerned, the, the lack of evidence for collecting in that sense shouldn't surprise us at all. In this gathering, I don't need to stress what a tiny proportion of the sculpture that once created in the Roman world has survived the furnaces and lime kilns. And this is to say nothing of works in more precious materials or inherently perishable materials like wood. One gets a sense from the wealthiest Roman villas, from, from sites like, the, like Hadrian's villa at Tivoli or the... Uh, uh, the, the Villa of the Quintili on the Via Appia, or some of the larger properties on the Bay of Naples, like the so-called Villa of Polius Felix, which may in fact be the Villa of Polius Felix, as described in detail by his friend Statius. We get a sense from sites like this of what we don't have 
of their original contents. Even in such an exceptional case as the Villa of the Papari at Herculaneum, where we do have a large, intellectually rich assemblage of extant sculptures, the evidence is not straightforward. We heard quite a bit about the Villa of the Papari yesterday, and I'm not going to go into detail about it. I'm certainly not going to go, go into any detail about the vexed question of its ownership. But it's clear that this is a very high-class property of the latter half of the first century BC, and because of the conditions of its destruction and excavation, it preserves almost uniquely uh, a huge assemblage, I think actually the single biggest assemblage of sculptures in the period, uh, many of which are in bronze. This assemblage is often called a collection. And we've heard yesterday about the repeated attempts that have been made to identify elaborate programs of meaning in the choice and deployment of the sculptures. None of these have commanded consensus. Uh, some of them have generally been unconvincing. And the pursuit of programs is perhaps fostered by a sort of uh, spurious visual homogeneity of the sculptures, which is the result, as Carol Matush has shown us, the result of 18th century restorations. Now, this obscures the fact that the sculptures are from different dates and different sources, and as a result, we might be even more tempted, in fact, to see the villa's ornamenta as a result of discriminating choices by its collector proprietor. And perhaps, indeed, this is the case. But the evidence is, is lacking, or at least we, there's no way of telling conclusively from the archaeological evidence if that's what we're actually seeing. It's perhaps revealing that the one work in this assemblage which can, most would say unproblematically, be linked to a renowned masterpiece is the replica of the Doriferos of Polycletus uh, found in the, in the villa's small palaestra. Yet this work, proudly signed by its copyist, Apollonios the Athenian, who is the real artist after all, reduces the famous athletic body, perhaps the most famous body in the ancient world, to a head. And we must doubt whether there was any thought here of explicitly evoking that particular prototype, uh, which all seeing archeologists believe they can recognize instantly. Moreover, in the light of the revisionist work on so-called Roman copies in recent years, we must start to suspect that the whole Roman literary discourse uh, around famous Greek artists and their works is rather divorced from the actual art that Romans encountered around them. Uh, that's something we might suspect already from Pliny the Elder's very explicitly text-based or text-biased art history in the last books of his Naturalis Historia. In the archeology, span we're not even getting a hint of the sort of gallery of important large-scale sculptures which is humorously conjured up by Lucian in his Philip Sudes, where he imagines a private house containing Maron's discus thrower and the tyrannicides of Critios and Nesiotes. But even at a more modest level, we're not detecting galleries of displayed sculptures of the kind that we would associate perhaps commonly with modern collecting. And I stress that I am talking here about the late Republic and the first couple of centuries AD. Uh, I think, as we'll hear later on, late antiquity offers different kinds of evidence. Perhaps more revealing is the absence of the tabulae picti, the portable panels which literature tells us about, not only in palaces or public buildings, uh, but in private collectors' homes. Now, this is certainly not surprising. Not one single panel painting of this kind survives from the classical world, and we wouldn't expect it to. But what I mean really is that the prevailing decor of Roman wall painting doesn't even allow for it apart from the evidence of, um, no doubt, much more uh, modest inserts into the frescoed walls of some houses in, in Pompeii. 
No, I guess we can be confident that pinakothekai, picture galleries that are mentioned in the sources, uh, did exist in some of the richest properties. Uh, Varro refers to people dining in pinakothekai because of the spectacle they offer as a backdrop. And he proposes doing the same in aporothekai, uh, fruiteries, uh, a word of his own invention. Uh, one of the manuscripts, one of the manuscripts of Vitruvius uh, that's used for many modern editions refers to the Pinacotheca as a room appropriate for upper class Romans with the status of magistrates. But I think we can still doubt whether this amounts to collecting of pictures um, uh, in the way we might imagine. Uh, d despite uh, critical references to the to the enthusiasm uh, to the, the enthusiasm that existed for acquiring uh, tabulae cicero's attitude may have been typical even among many of the very highly educated in his letters he talks about ordering ordering tabellae to to decorate ornare exedrae in a portico of his tusculan villa because as he puts it if I like anything of that kind, I like painting. Si quid generis istius modi me delectat, pictura delectat. In extant painting, everything we encounter of this kind is, is, is in the form of fictive panels, uh, dominated by ordered architectonic schemes. And in such a huge villa as that of Plantis, decorated more or less during Cicero's lifetime. Um, we, we have regular references to uh, uh, hanging tabellae uh, in these sorts of sanctuary-like contexts, uh, but no, no hint that actual picture galleries could fit into the decor of the villa. Later on, of course, we see the Pinacotheca uh, scheme, the evocation of picture galleries as, as a, a, a particular mode of fresco decoration. And we can suspect that the uh, collection of real expensive important panels uh, may have been the preserve of an elite within the elite, a preserve of a very few collectors, the likes of uh, Lucius Licinius Lucullus, perhaps, or Quintus Hortensius Hortalus, who, as we heard yesterday, bought one antique painting, The Argonauts, for the vast sum of 144,000 sesterces, an exception worth mentioning by Pliny a century and a half later. In short, the archaeology certainly supports our belief in collections of art in the sense of assemblages in the domestic sphere, but it can't flesh out our assumptions about modern style collecting uh, in the late Republic and early Empire. So we fall back on the literary sources. And once again, there are abundant references to the love of artworks and antique luxuries, though less commonly to art hunting as such, or to how collectors went about their practice of acquiring works. There are a few good examples, but uh, perhaps exceptional examples, exceptions that prove the rule. Uh, Seneca's 500 citrus wood tables that we heard about yesterday. Asinius Pollio it varies, of course, the corrupt uh, governor uh, prosecuted by Cicero who, who acquired notable works of art uh, almost as if they were booty won in war uh, rather, than, uh, rather than acquired in peace. But we don't have a lot of evidence of the, as it were, the normal collecting processes or uh, acquisition processes um, of, 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 uh, of, of Roman collectors. What we do encounter in the sources consistently and regularly is clear evidence for the existence of Roman connoisseurship. Uh, that is to say, we, we, positive references to connoisseurship. We also have uh, critical, uh, uh, sometimes satirical references to the love of acquiring luxuries. 
I'm not talking here just about the sort of art historical awareness or theoretical awareness demonstrated by an author like Cicero, but of the appreciation of specific objects as, as possessions. This is the sort of connoisseurship that put on show the sorts of cultural knowledge and skills of interpretation which marked a Roman aristocrat out as a member of his class, which is also, crudely speaking, the class that wrote our texts. I wonder to what extent the practice of connoisseurship and the consumption of art it implied is dominant in Roman concerns uh, rather than collecting or acquisition as such. Now, obviously, those things aren't separate, but it's a, it's a shift of emphasis, I think, in the way that we treat the sources. Um, I'm going to pass over Trimalchio here, we touched on yesterday, but it's worth noting that this is one of the very few sources that actually talks about the extent of a collection, in this case, <laughs> with the purpose of monetizing uh, the, the collection of silver in a way that shows up uh, Trimalchio's inadequacies as a connoisseur. But I want to pass on to something, a kind of consumption and a kind of connoisseurship that is not usually mentioned in this context, uh, and that is Roman wine connoisseurship. Now, notwithstanding the 10,000 jars of wine that Hortensius uh, uh, left at his death, um, uh, and the well-attested interest in old vintages, sometimes very old vintages, we don't have evidence of the Romans collecting jars of wine in the way that modern collectors do, you know, for the sake for the sake of collecting. Romans had these things for the sake of drinking, uh, reasonably enough. Um, but in other respects, Roman wine appreciation is very reminiscent of modern connoisseurship. And we learn a lot about it, particularly from Book 14 of Pliny's Natural History. And here he presents uh, the terminology, he presents a hierarchy of, of wines as well, in very much the same way that, for example, in his final book, he presents the hierarchy of gems that are admired uh, by collectors and connoisseurs. And what the fact that he is talking about a kind of connoisseurship is uh, emphasized by, uh, for example, this quotation here where he's referring to uh, one of Augustus's freedmen who is uh, uh, Eudiciorum ac palati peritissimum Peritissimus, peritus, is very much a word that recurs in different kinds of connoisseurship. It's also interesting that uh, Cicero can use wines, the style of wines, as an analogy for Greek rhetorical styles in exactly the way that he uses uh, uh, sculpture as an analogy uh, for rhetorical styles. So... Um, I think that um, uh, our emphasis probably should be on connoisseurship and on the, the patterns of connoisseurship in the consumption of works of art and luxuries. And there's not a big distinction between what I've just been talking about and the kind of language, the kind of attitude displayed by Pliny the Younger in perhaps the most famous example of Roman connoisseurship where he, he's, he's talking about uh, a small bronze, not this of course, but a small bronze in this form that he's acquired, uh, which he, he actually says he's not going to collect, he's going to give it as a dedication in a temple. Now of course Pliny the Younger is sh showing off the fact that he's not uh, keeping this Corinthian bronze in his house, he's showing off his modesty uh, in that respect, it's a sort of recusatio which perhaps indirectly attests to the existence of collections of this kind. Uh, and it is perhaps with small objects like this, with small bronzes, with other kinds of small luxuries, uh, like uh, marine ware or the uh, engraved gems that we heard a little bit about yesterday from Ken, that we need to look for things that we would recognize as collections in the modern sense. But again, the, 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 uh, the, the sources are dominated by a sort of connoisseurial attitude to this sort of material um, uh, rather than uh, an interest in the building up of collections as such. 
So just to finish off, I've talked about various kinds of thekai. Uh, briefly, dactyliothekai, gem, gem collections or gem stores, aporothekai, uh, pinakothekai. So I just want to finish with perhaps the most familiar kind of theca, the bibliotheca, the library or the, the book repository. And although libraries are not normally thought of as collections in the Roman world, they have many of the features of collections. And it's interesting that George Houston's recent comprehensive book about Roman libraries consistently refers to them as collections. Let's have an appropriate picture. Um, Romans collected books in the sense that they sought out particular texts. We know of a work by Philon of Byblos uh, called Pericateseus Kai Ecloges Biblion on the acquisition and uh, selection of books. But there's also evidence for special volumes as objects being sought out. For example, autographed authors' copies of uh, rolls of books. Um, so categories like this, I think, can broaden what we're looking at and help us to think more about the attitudes of collectors as, as connoisseurs, as consumers of these sorts of precious uh, commodities. To finish where I started off, the Romans did collect art. They collected many other things as well. And to suggest that their art collecting as we experience it in the archeological and literary evidences is, is not proper collecting in the modern sense may seem to be a bit of a red herring. After all, modern collectors often post-rationalize their collecting choices, which may not be as systematic or as unworldly as the word collection might imply. Nevertheless, what I've tried to demonstrate here is some of the flexibility in the concept as we encounter it in ancient sources, or the, the flexibility at least which we need to, with which we need to treat the concept of collecting if we're to do, do justice to Roman assumptions and Roman categories of thought. Thank you very much. Allora, grazie, anche perché sarà, immagino, molto stimolante in seguito a discutere su questi concetti partendo soprattutto dall'ultimo, la flessibilità e le relazioni tra collezionista o connois in una, in uno scambio piuttosto intenso fra varie categorie di oggetti, anche perché, se mi posso permettere, quando è stato individuato il peritus per eh, un esperto di vini, un peritus è, è esperto a tutto tondo, anche bene dicendi, come si dice, per cui insomma anche la terminologia allarga a sistemi molto flessibili. Poi magari sarà da discutere sul concetto di qualche cosa che termina in teca, <ride> come appunto apoteca, biblioteca, dattidioteca, per capire di che cosa possa o potesse trattarsi in, in antico, insomma, e se è un qualche cosa che si, o nel mondo romano si rapporta concettualizzandola uh, il nostro concetto di raccolta, se non di collezione. Scusate, questa era una mia... Perspective, not in a Plutarch <laughs> vision. <laughs> Comunque, passerei, grazie, passerei al prossimo intervento di Gabriella Cirucci, eh, della Scuola Normale Superiore di Pisa, che eh, è una degli organizzatori di questo stimolantissimo incontro per cui nulla verrà detto sui suoi lavori, ma che eh, riguardano in particolare appunto momenti o quelli che io conosco meglio, scusami, di, eh, relativi a concetti di collezione, reimpiego, riuso di opere greche in contesti romani, per cui a spettro ampio. Quindi, oh mamma mia, troppo brutto. Il titolo è molto interessante. <ride> Too ugly to be collected, an aspect of Greek originals found in Roman contests. Grazie. Grazie. Speriamo che non sia troppo brutto. Eh. Speriamo di no, ho eh. fatto del mio meglio. Eh. Grazie. Eh. Scusate. 
per andare avanti con... Scusate. Sono andata avanti io, se tu me lo dici ti vado avanti. Ah, ah ok, sì. Tu di... ah, no, no, deve farlo lei. No, so... no, 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 it's a finger here with a, with a ring, so maybe a part of the tiliotheca. Okay. Grazie, scusate, sono un po'... No, don't worry, hi. Ok, scusatemi. So, the numerous masterpieces by the old masters of the Greek classical and late classical period owned by Romans, both publicly and privately, according to the ancient authors, have played, um, as we have already seen, a fundamental role in constructing and authorizing the scholarly discourse on Roman art collections and collecting practices. But the extent to which art or taste was a primary factor in the acquisition and accumulation of such, of such objects, however, is very controversial, as many of you have um, already shown. Moreover, archaeological excavations reveal that the interest of the Romans was not confined to the great names and the most admired works known from literary sources. Indeed, other categories of Greek artifacts of the classical period, such as architectural sculptures, funerary monuments, and votive reliefs, were similarly removed from their original contexts and reused as sculptural decoration of Roman spaces. In my presentation today, I would like to focus not so much, or not only, on the lost originals by the old masters mentioned by ancient sources and reconstructed by means of copying critique, as, as on the numerous Greek marble sculptures and reliefs dating to the 5th and to the 4th centuries BC that were found reused in Rome. In particular, I would like to address the questions raised by these objects by especially highlighting the specific contribution they may offer to our discussion on Roman collecting. Before going on, I would like to spend some, some words on the title of my paper, um, Greek Originals is the label most commonly used by scholars to designate the antiquities imported from the Greek word. The quotation marks surrounding the word in my title indicate the slight inadequacy of this term. Greek originals is not used in this case to designate the prototype, but it retains all the historical and cultural connotation of the label. As it refers to creative invention, authenticity, uniqueness, it could suggest an aesthetic bias or mask a preconceived interpretation by alluding to the superiority line in its not being a copy, nor a fake, nor a replication. <laughs> oh, oh, yes. <laughs> Studies on Roman art collecting have very frequently stressed its fundamental connection with Roman plunder of Greek art. The imagery that is commonly conjured up when we think about the Roman appropriation of Greek art is that of the, of the triumphal procession with its exhibition of temple and city treasures, so gold, silver, bronze, jewels, costly textiles, and famous paintings and statues by the old masters. From the end of the third century BC onwards, thousands of Greek originals looted at Spolia ended up in Roman sanctuaries. In the slide, you can read a famous passage by Plutarch, who describes the display of the spoils of Syracuse after Marcellus sack of the city as a watershed in Roman appreciation of Greek art. Relying, relying mostly on the information provided by written sources, the conventional approach to Roman art collecting has, in fact, favored favor the focus on selected categories of objects and on specific audiences, historical periods, personalities, and settings. 
as shows the example of the apoxiomenos mentioned yesterday. As we know from Pliny the Elder, the statue was dedicated in Rome in front of the bats built by Marcus Agrippa. Studies in Roman collecting convincingly pointed out the high level of investment, economic, social, political, religious, aesthetic, cultural, emotional, made by the Romans in Greek originals. And also in ancient literature, as has been noticed on many occasions, there is no univocal term to designate them. Ancient authors attest to the highly positive evaluation of the features which characterized the Greek originals. Antiquity, artistic quality, material value, market price, attribution to a canonical artist, provenance, and or prestige of their previous owners. But when we shift from the masterpieces attested in ancient literature to the marble sculptures and reliefs found in Rome, our understanding becomes less clear, since a similar pattern of reception cannot be applied to them mechanically. In this vein, it's worth questioning if we should limit ourselves to interpret them only in light of literary sources. Indeed, these objects offer a slightly different view on the types of Greek artworks of the classical period that the Romans could own and accumulate. Starting from La Rocca's publication of the pedimental sculptures of the temple of Apollo Susiano 30 years ago, our knowledge of this material has been significantly enriched thanks to several important discoveries in many fields related to study of the history of collecting, to research in museum and other institutions archives, to investigation of old excavation records. As alluded to in the slide by the example of the Centrale Monte Martini, the results of these studies have been also amply disseminated through specific museographic choices. Thus, both the general public and the scholarly community nowadays are confronted with <coughs> Greek originals attesting to the pervasive reuse of Greek art of the classical period in the city of Rome. This renovated scientific interest also fostered the re-evaluation of already known sculptures and reliefs that have been previously discarded on the basis of negative aesthetic judgments. The considerations made by Enrico Paribani in a paper delivered in 1968 at the Eighth Convegno di Studi sulla Magna Grecia in Taranto exemplary show the categories and premises that underlay these judgments. Complaining the discrepancy between the almost fabulous magniloquence of literary sources and the very modest balance of available evidence, he described what remains as some dozen marbles, most of them of very mediocre appearance, and explained, for obvious reasons, I haven't taken into account sculptures that are too mediocre or problematic, such as votive reliefs. A similar prejudice against serial production seems to have oriented Werner Fuchs' interpretation of the reliefs found in a shipwreck near Madia off the coast of Tunisia, where a ship foundered while carrying statuary and luxury goods from Greece in the early first, first century BC. We will return later on the cargo, but here I would like to stress his suggestion about, in the slide, older Attic inscriptions and water reliefs dating to the fourth century BC that apparently come from sanctuaries in Piraeus and perhaps have served as ballast for the ship. The Greek marble sculptures and reliefs dating to the 5th and to the 1st centuries BC that were found reused in Rome constitute a relatively small, around 70 exemplars, but significant corpus, which has never been published as a whole, 
consisting mostly of architectural sculptures and of relief sculptures that had a funerary or votive function in their first context of use. Unfortunately, the absence of any direct mention of them in literary sources and the fact that most of the material comes from badly documented excavations or has had a long post-antique history makes difficult not only to attribute them to a specific origin in terms of authorship, provenance, display setting, but also to assign them to a precise Roman social historical context, to pinpoint the chronology of their transfer, to identify patterns, and to reconstruct their reception. These same conditions also have a major bearing on their art historical understanding, since as reused objects, they can be only dated and therefore authenticated by beings of connoisseurship. For all these reasons, these Greek originals appear to have entered the narratives on ancient collecting only as somewhat ancillary to the lost originals known from literary sources. There are, of course, a handful of notable and much discussed exceptions, such as the reconstruction of the pediment of the Temple of Apollo Sosiano that we have seen before. Notwithstanding the numerous studies devoted to individual exemplars, types, and context of reuse, moreover, current reevaluation of these extant Greek originals of Rome has not yet succeeded in stimulating a critical reflection on the methodological and hermeneutical challenges opened up by the peculiarity of this material. Although most of these finds lack proper documentation or were not in situ, there can be few doubts that the Romans who bought them considered them as valuable and desirable objects, whatever the reasons might be. The way we interpret their value and des desirability, on the other hand, is always somewhat consistent with our expectations about how Roman patrons and audiences understood art, originality, authenticity, Greekness. And this is particularly evident when we are dealing with small anonymous objects of not outstanding quality, such as the marble votive reliefs that were produced in Attica and in other centers of the Greek world during the fourth century BC. I would like to focus today only a selection of examples that show the value and desirability to the Romans of such objects. The first is the already mentioned cargo of the Madea shipwreck. The exhibition held in Bonn in 1994 after the restoration of the findings in the Rheinisches Landesmuseum and the two volumes of essays that were published on that occasion are a fundamental milestone in the study of ancient art collecting and the ancient art market. The ship contains almost anything a scholar interested in the topic could ask for. The main cargo consisted of around 70 large columns, but there were also a bronze statue of, statue of Eros, a bronze arm signed by the sculptor Boetus of Chalcedon, bronze statuettes, fulcra, and other couch elements in bronze, marble candelabra, together with bronze lamps, marble baths, and other bronze and marble fragments. The chronology of these objects ranges from the mid-second to the early first century BC, when the ship sank. So some of these objects were new, others were old. After this overview, I, it would appear somewhat difficult to go beyond our collections in this case. I would like to attract, attract your attention now again to the votive reliefs that we have seen before. The restoration, the study, and the re-evaluation of the shipwreck and its findings have led scholars to consider these objects as art artworks in their own right, together with a less well-preserved fourth century relief of the goddess Sibylle, which I'm not showing today. A fourth relief, a stele inscribed 
with an, with an Athenian decree um, ordering dedication to the someone adorned with a relief was also added to the group. The cargo, however, contained also other saleable and valuable objects that could not have had a merely utilitarian function. These are the four um, inscribed marble objects in the slide to the right, you can see the better preserved of them, that have been studied very thoroughly by epigraphists, but very rarely attracted the, attracted the attention of those interested in Roman collecting, except for the fact that they helped identify Athens as the possible place where the cargo was loaded. The common interpretation is that these marbles were destined to a more utilitarian function, so they were desirable and saleable, not as, an, as antiques, but as valuable material. Even Roman antiquarianism had its limits. Thus, we cannot exclude that these old Athenian inscriptions were understood as pieces of marble. For example, <laughs> studies in the artillery of um, classical antiquity have shown that columnar funerary monuments have been reused during the Hellenistic period as bullets for catapults. So some functional reuse could be very effective. Again, the way we evaluate these objects seems somewhat consistent with our ideas about how Romans understood art, originality, authenticity, Greekness. The second example that I would like to show to assess the value and desirability of these objects are the votive reliefs found in Pompeii. So more details are available in my article on the topic, but for our purposes today, I would only like to focus briefly on the early Hellenistic votive relief of Aphrodite and Eros found in the house of the Golden Cupids. This is a large, lavishly decorated house, which is relatively well documented. In the slide, you can see the plan and the two views of the peristyle with the sculpture ensemble displayed in the garden, consisting of various marble statuettes, arms, herms, reliefs, and oscilla. Changes in the architecture and decoration of the house have been dated before the earthquake in 62 AD. Then after this event, the house was restored and new changes were added to its structure and decoration. The Aphrodite relief was found set in the peristyle south wall together with other reliefs of various dates reused as wall ornaments after the earthquake. As shown in the plan by Jessica Powers, to whose investigation I refer for further details, other valuable emblemata of various materials were set in the portico, including obsidian panels set in the wall at the higher level and the famous set of four gold, four gold glass medallion in the room I on the north side of the peristyle from which the house was named. Power's article has explored very thoroughly the visual experience that the owners of the house intended his visitors to have by showing how the materiality of the different wall decorations, paintings, color, light, was meant to interact to create variety. I would like to return now to the Aphrodite relief and to look at it not as an isolated Greek original, but together with the other marble reliefs belonging to the same set of wall ornaments in the south portico. Many of them show traces of repair and reworking, and all of them provide evidence of having been used in a different display setting before being attached to the wall. The mask reliefs were double-sided, of the same type as those that were found mounted on pillars in the garden. And drill holes on the preserved upper edge uh, showed that they were formally suspended as oscilla. In this house, we can thus appreciate how display settings, especially in the private realm, 
could change even in a very short time span and how this may affect our understanding. And this is not only something that we should always be reminded when approaching ancient collections of objects, but also something that can be more difficult to catch if we rely only on literary sources. Uh, so looking at the Aphrodite relief in its context allows us to assess the value and desirability to Roman house owners, even of very modest old Greek votive reliefs. But this case makes also very clear, as already said before, to which extent our interpretation of the role played by Greek antiques in Roman contexts depend on our expectation about how, Roman, how Romans evaluated artistry, originality, authenticity, and Greekness. So, how far were the Romans aware of the provenance of these objects, and how did they evaluate it? Were these moments, monuments appreciated as Greek originals? Were they esteemed more generally as antiques? Were they perhaps perceived as a comparatively economic, secondhand, recycled alternative to contemporary works? The role played by Greek originals in Roman public and private spaces is still a much discussed and controversial issue in current scholarship as Jane has shown us yesterday and Peter today. If recent museological research has helped clarify many of the multifaceted aspects and implications of Roman art collecting, this perspective is strongly opposed by other scholars, like Tony Holscher, who argues, uh, argues against the incidents of aesthetic evaluation by pointing out that the Roman response was more practical and merely interested in the capacity of ancient Greek art to embody contemporary values. And as is shown in the slide, these contrasting interpretations concern not only the masterpieces of the old masters, but also the votive and funerary reliefs found reused in Roman contexts. Putting this debate, this debate aside for now, and moving toward the end of my paper, I would like to draw your attention on how a better knowledge of these of, often overlooked artifacts may contribute to current understanding of Roman collecting. In this vein, facing the ugliness and mediocrity of these objects in critical terms may also give us the chance to question our interpretive paradigms and to reflect on which are our approaches, methodologies, and expectations when reconstructing a context for these sculptures. The examples of the votive reliefs from the Madia shipwreck and of the, and of the votive reliefs found in the houses of Pompeii have already shown that these objects were valuable and desirable to the Romans. I would like to argue now that by focusing on their materiality, we can also suggest that the Roman patrons acknowledged and desired the, the distinctiveness of these Greek antiques. In their first use, the marble votive reliefs that were produced in Attica and in other centers of the Greek world during the first century BC were gifts for the gods dedicated at centuries that represented one or more gods and humans in a standardized iconography in order to express the veneration of worshippers in the most proper way, and carried inscriptions that recorded the names of the dedicants and of the recipient deities. In the slide, you can see the rest of the pillars that supported these reliefs displayed as freestanding sculptures in the sanctity of Artemis at Brauren, and on the right, the reliefs of Xenocrateia, which commemorates the foundation of a sanctuary to the river god um, Kephisos in Phaleron. This is one of the few marble reliefs which is preserved together with its support. 
um, which is um, made of limestone in this case. The placement of this uh, votive, um, the placement of these votive gifts in Greek sanctuaries implies some structural and technical devices, such as the presence of a tenon on the bottom side of the reliefs, allowing them to be installed on the support. As we have seen in the House of the Golden Cupids, the tenon become, uh, became an accessory when the reliefs were set in walls. Indeed, the tenon appears to have been removed on, on many of the Greek votive reliefs found reused in Roman contexts, such as the banquet relief found on the Via Ardiatina near Casale San Paolo to the right in the slide. To the left, you can see a votive relief to the nymphs, now in Berlin, that was found on the Quirinal Hill in what was a um, residential area in antiquity. So it, does, it is possible that the relief belong to one of the houses documented in the area and in particular, uh, as has been suggested, to the house of Emilia Paulina Asiatica dating to the second century AD. The relief shows traces of ancient repair and rework in the surface of the broken right side that has been smoothed with a chisel in order to restore the missing parts, and the molding on top has been lowered in order to remove the inscription. The reworking and restoration of these reliefs do not only document a different display setting for them in their new context of use, but also allow some general considerations on how these objects could impact on the Roman viewers. The quality and the aging of marble the carving technique, the format and typology, the presence of a tenon and or inscription were all elements that could easily distinguish these reliefs from more recent ones. Moreover, it is undeniable that the sculptors entrusted with restoring these marbles had the occasion to directly interact with ancient materials, techniques and forms although it cannot be presumed that all of them were interested in and capable of dating them. In this vein, the antiquarian value of these objects could have been very differently understood and appreciated according to the education and knowledge of their vendors and buyers. And over time, uh, according to the education and knowledge of their owners. So, to conclude, I would like to recall the set of qualities that, according to ancient sources, made Greek originals valuable and desirable, which means saleable at the exorbitant prices that Gianfranco has shown us yesterday. As we have seen before, these characteristics were antiquity, artistic quality, material value, market price, attribution to economical artists, provenance, and or prestige of their previous owners. So even if we want to keep the value and desirability of these objects at its minimum, I would add at least material value and antiquity to the list of the values assessed through their acquisition and display. Thank you very much for your kind attention. <laughs> Allora, grazie, ma insomma, abbiamo apprezzato anche l'altra faccia della, della raccolta e o del collezionismo guardando meglio allora. Poi te la sei presa in maniera particolare con questo Totem Mar degli Efs che io ho qui, insomma, da, di recente acquisizione da Casale San Paolo, ma insomma 
è dignitoso come un pezzo dignitoso è dignitoso è dignitoso e quello è quello che poi sarà interessante e anche un aspetto a mio avviso poi magari faremo ci sarà una discussione anche l'aver privilegiato per questa categoria di monumenti una parts rispetto al tutto una parts pro toto mettendo anche una forte eh, differenziazione rispetto a quello che poteva essere l'insieme di elementi di valore riferiti all'originale in contesto e alla parte in un nuovo contesto quindi anche questa materialità e il valore in quanto tale potrebbe essere una linea interessante però chiedo a tutti voi se avendo 5 minuti eh, preferite porre qualche domanda a coloro che sono intervenuti stamani, cioè Falaschi, Stuart, Cirucci, o rimandare tutto alla fine della mattinata. Mi rimetto alla eh, indicazione dell'uditorio. Forse, forse è meglio una pausa adesso. I'm very happy to see you here again and introduce you, sorry for that because this is my misunderstanding for here and so please Susan Walker, University of Oxford, no presentation for her because she's very famous and sorry, uh, yeah surely at home here I suppose and uh, No, <laughs> the king and the philosopher displaying bronzes in later antiquity in the house of Venus at Volubilis. Thank you. Right, time to restore a little decorum. <laughs> Voglio ringraziare gli uh, organizzatori di questo uh, convegno, soprattutto Gabriele Cirucci che ho incontrata per la prima volta l'anno scorso nel Paradiso Ghetti. <ride> uh, adesso uh, uh, siamo nel Paradiso della Scuola Normale e sono molto lieta di essere invitata ancora una volta a, a Pisa. So, uh, we are going to now do something completely different and uh, visit Volubilis, and it, I hope you'll find it an interesting attempt to apply uh, some of the principles we've been hearing about, uh, particularly those uh, raised uh, yesterday by, by Jana in her paper. So a bronze bust of Juba II, and an inscribed bon bronze bust of the younger Cato are among the finest and most famous Roman portraits to have survived from antiquity. And most scholars are well aware that these uh, come from the southern fringes of the Roman Empire, the city of Volubilis in modern Morocco. The remote inland provenience of such fine portraits is in itself unexpected. More remarkable still is the context in which they were found, which has hardly caused any comment at all. Uh, the portraits of Juba and Cato were part of a late Roman, at this point my text says private collection, but actually uh, I'm going to take another term from uh, modern contemporary art and say a late Roman private conceptual installation of much earlier sculptures. And uh, in fact, the display of these imposing images of these two great men was very wittily contrived, uh, most likely for the amusement of the house owner and guests. Uh, that the display context is so little understood is due to sustained argument over the date of the house in which they were found during excavations undertaken in the course of the Second World War and its aftermath uh, by the French archaeologist Raymond Touvenot. 
Then, as now geographically remote, the excavation of Volubilis um, aroused considerable uh, interest, not least in the potential power of, inverted commas, civilizing European imperial missions. With the labor of German prisoners of war, the French authorities invested heavily in the conservation and reconstruction of this impressive city. You see here the northeast gate leading to the residential quarter and in the middle distance, uh, the center of Volubilis. Uh, Volubilis had been the capital of the province of Mauritania Tingitana and thus was lavishly endowed with public buildings and imposing defenses. And uh, the growing uh, sense of identity of Lublis as a Roman outpost of civilization in the desert is not in the desert, it's in the fertile rolling landscapes of the foothills of the northern Atlas, um, inspired further study and sometimes acrimonious debate about the date of the urban fabric, particularly of the sumptuous private residences. Volubilis was formally abandoned by the Roman authorities in AD 285 after a series of tribal raids on the city, a typically hard-headed decision on the part of the Emperor Diocletian, whose provincial administrators were ordered to retreat to the cities of the Mediterranean and Atlantic coasts. The last formal records inscribed on stone date to AD 280, and there has been a reluctance on the part of modern scholars to admit to any life of social, cultural, or economic consequence in Volubilis from that date to the foundation of the nearby holy Islamic city of Moulay Idris half a millennium later. In addition, the Roman mosaics of Mauritania Tingitana, I show you just three from the House of Venus in Volubilis here, have been regarded as having their own regional identity. And so there's been little attempt to compare uh, the remarkable pavements of Volubilis with better dated examples elsewhere. My own engagement uh, with Volubilis um, arises from an ambitious project undertaken by the Institute of Archaeology, University College London, in 2002-3, co-directed by Lisa Fentress, Hassan Liman, and Gaetano Palumbo, the project comprised the excavation of early Islamic volubilis, that was the easy bit, uh, the conservation of the site, which was by then in acute danger of tumbling into the nearby wadi, the design and construction of a site museum over which I shall draw a very discreet veil today, and the reinterpretation of the visible remains to visitors. And that last element was, was my job uh, in this project. And I have to say visitors did not get a lot of, uh, a lot of cheer visiting Volubilis uh, at that point. Uh, I recall rather rusting iron signs then, by then even uh, 50 years old, uh, generally inscribed with admonitions like défense de marché sur les mosaïques. However, with uh, great generosity, uh, we were given the House of Venus, which is circled on the German plan uh, from Martina Rees's book uh, on the right of the screen uh, as a pilot project. Uh, while the excavation on the northern slopes below the Roman city clearly showed evidence uh, for continuous habitation of Volubilis in late antiquity and indeed the early Islamic period. So uh, the, the late antique early Islamic city is, is, is down here. Um, Uh, the survey uh, of the standing remains uh, of the House of Venus uh, suggested a number of phases of occupation and a late, late antique installation of the bronze portrait busts. And this was not well received uh, as a conclusion for the reasons I've, I've, I've given above. Um, Thirteen years later, 
we hope for a more positive response uh, to our work. But I cannot overstress the need for further excavation of the house which, and, and its environs, which was not possible at the time. So looking at the context of the busts, the House of Venus is located within the northeast quarter of Alublis, and it's the third of a row of five large houses built to the south of the southern Decumanus I in the later first or early second century AD. Although these houses have been considered to be the residences of the city's elite, the House of Venus is unusual even within this group uh, for the lack of any facility for agricultural processing or commerce. And you see on Martina Reese's plan, uh, the House of Venus is the upper of the two houses within the red uh, circle, and it hasn't got any colour on it, which means it hasn't got an oil press, it hasn't got a bakery, it hasn't got any shops. It's got no visible means of support uh, of the cultural life uh, that took place uh, within it. Um, in my view, which needs to be tested by further excavation, it's possible that this material support came from the adjacent house of the bronze bust, so named for the discovery in a small service room very close to its original display context of the bust of Juba. And we should perhaps see that uh, narrow lane, the triangular lane between the two houses, which uh, was certainly closed at the south end at some time in its history as less of a lane and more of a courtyard linking these two properties. So I'm talking about this, this space here. So that's the House of Venus, and this is the House of the Bronze Bus. And I, I think they're intimately connected, but we need to dig a hole to prove it. Um, so uh, among the finds from uh, two of Noah's excavations are the two bronze portraits you saw at the start of the paper of exceptional quality with both local and empire-wide historic uh, resonance. Uh, one uh, on the left in this computer-generated reconstruction of their setting is ahead of the Mauritanian king, Juba II, a protege of Augustus, who proved the most distinguished ruler of the client kingdom of Mauritania an intellectual who created a version of the Hellenistic cultural capital of Alexandria in his own coastal capital city of Yol Kaiseria, that's modern Cherchel in Algeria, uh, no doubt with the aid of his formidable queen, Cleopatra Selene, daughter of the even more formidable Cleopatra VII of Egypt. And the other bust on the right is, is of the younger Cato, uh, 95 to 46 BC, the Roman Republican politician and Stoic philosopher who took his own life at Utica rather than submit to Caesar. Cato was an intractable man seen by many of his admirers as the epitome of Roman moral heroism. The bust of Cato, however, was found in one of two connected adjoining rooms in the southwestern sector of the House of Venus toppling from a brick plinth on which it had been set to gaze at an image of the beautiful youth Hylas, the central figure on the mosaic panel below. Uh, the head of Juba, as I've noted, was found in a service room uh, in the house next door. And though the association has been questioned, it's a reasonable inference that the head of Juba was displayed in antiquity on a second plinth located in a room physically linked with that where the bust of Cato was found. And the head of Juba was most likely commissioned during his lifetime in the last decades of the first century BC, while that of Cato, labelled in inlaid silver on the bust, is a retrospective work dated to the reign of Nero, AD 54 to 68. So however we date the House of Venus, both heads are definitely in secondary use here, and both of them were displayed to view the principal protagonists in the mosaic pavements before them, uh, Juba's gazing at an image of the bathing uh, Diana. The 
Plinth supporting the bust of Juba was deliberately set off centre to align the king's gaze with the figure uh, of the bathing Diana, effectively making him a second Actaeon, the likely identity of the damaged figure peeping at Diana from behind a tree. Uh, and I think in both of these installations, comic eroticism was the apparent motivation. So uh, I would say we've seen here rather, we see here rather a good example of many of the, po uh, the points made yesterday by Jana. There's no question of the intentionality of this arrangement, nor can there be any doubt of the creation of a new narrative, though, of course, we don't know the original narrative, the original location of the busts or the story they first told. We see, too, the network of non-human interactions between the bronzes and the mosaic pavements, and the valuing of the narrative above the design of the pavement, which suffers uh, from the placement of Juba. Uh, so, I mean, if you have a look at the upper image here, for example, this is the pedestal's a ring. This is way off centre, and as a result, the designer of the mosaics got into difficulties here uh, with a blank panel inserted here, and the borders are of unequal size. Not a problem in the adjacent room, because Cato is bang in the middle uh, of the wall so the mosaic is, is balanced. But I think this is a very good archaeological example of intentionality, narrative, uh, taking uh, precedence over uh, formal design. And we see here, too, use of memory and the past, uh, but history here is completely subvertive uh, uh, for a good laugh. <laughs> I mean, it's just, it's a joke. Uh, we, what we don't have, of course, is the process of selection and rejection and any sense of infinity. This is the last, one of the last things to happen in the House of Venus. We are, I think, in late antiquity. And the arrangement actually survived, uh, at least for Juba, until, uh, sorry, for Cato, until the 20th century, somehow buried and escaping the recyclers who were certainly operating in the neighbouring rooms of the house. Well, the paired mosaics are among the finest uh, in Volubilis, but the house is actually named after a third panel set in the floor of the nearby triclinium depicting Venus sailing in a ship amidst a cortege of Cupids, Nereids and Tritons. This last pavement was lifted in the 1960s and is now displayed in the Kasbah Museum in Tangier. The House of Venus, as excavated, appears to be a late antique residence with several features suggesting a 4th century date for the principal visible installations. Yet Tuvenel dated the building from coin finds to during or after the reign of Marcus Aurelius, 161-180, thus coeval with or subsequent to the construction of the outer city walls. The bath suite, certainly a later installation, was dated by Tuvano to the middle years of the 3rd century, with coin finds ranging from the Severan dynasty to Gordian. And uh, as I've intimated, the construction date for the house was actually pushed earlier by limited excavations undertaken by Makhdun in the 1990s, uh, pushing it back into the 1st century AD. And the difficulty is that everyone's assumed that the mosaic pavements are, are a primary installation. However, now we're going to do some nitty-gritty archaeology here. Very recent observation by Niccolò Mugnai uh, of the suite of rooms housing the Hylas and Diana mosaics supports the view that the installation of the portrait busts is to be placed uh, in a sequence at least two phases of occupation later than the original house plan and the mosaics and the pedestals supporting the sculptures are contemporary. So the design of the mosaics in both rooms deliberately frames the pedestals. Um, and so uh, you can see circled in the centre picture the crenellated ornament around the western end of the pavement uh, in the room with the Diana mosaic, which gives focus to the west wall where the pedestal stands at lower left of slide. Uh, like the pedestal, the mosaic's evidently off-centre. I've already... <coughs> Uh, discuss that. Uh, and yet the ornament surrounding the pedestal is symmetrically designed. 
Uh, and all of this really indicates that the juxtaposition of Juba and Diana was prioritized over the appearance of the entire floor. On the right, you see the pedestal in the room with the Hylas mosaic clearly butted against an outer wall and the gap awkwardly filled with paving stones tipped on end, probably off cut from the stones used for the base and the cap of the brick built pedestal. In contrast, the pedestal uh, in Diana's room is integrated with the outer wall, but the wall itself, which you see in the upper left slide, uh, shows a clear break in the line and the nature of the construction to uh, the north of a large horizontally laid grey-blue limestone block at its southern end. And this west wall is composed uh, of larger stones than those uh, used in the original build seen to the left. So that's, that's phase one, that's the original build, and then this is much later. There are, of course, some modern interventions here too, uh, which I, I won't go into today. Meanwhile, the tablinum, or uh, ecus, or even possibly an excedra of the main peristyle of the house, was used to display a much earlier bronze sculpture too, in this case a genre figure of a fisherman, most likely of late Hellenistic date. So all of these sculptures predate the house of Venus, and they must therefore have been installed uh, when they became available uh, to the owner, and following the abandonment or repurposing of the original settings, which of course uh, remain unknown. A likely occasion, at least for the bronze um, busts, would be the abandonment of public buildings and grander residences following the withdrawal of the Roman administration in the AD 280s. There are a lot of other late antique interventions in the House of Venus, which I won't mention today, uh, but for one which is relevant, and that is that an arm of this fisherman was found partially dismembered in a small room to uh, the north of the Tablinum, that, uh, sorry, to the south of the Tablinum. Uh, that room seems to have served for the collection of bronze and marble sculptures apparently destined for melting down or burning in a kiln to recycle the metal or make lime activities that surely happened after the sculptures had lost their significance for display and thus are most likely after the abandonment of the House of Venus as a formal residence. So this find uh, implies that there was more sculpture than we know about. Um, uh, and in fact, in addition, a river god and a lion in archaizing almost Etruscan style have survived. They're quite small sculptures which are thought to have decorated the fountain and water features respectively located in the second uh, courtyard and the main peristyle. So, at the time of installation of the bronze busts, three major pavements decorated the triclinium and the cubicular displaying the bronzes, the latter accessed via a courtyard with a fountain. The three floors are decorated with emblemata bearing narrative mythological scenes of some complexity. Venus seated on the prow of a boat, rowed by the three graces, accompanied by a large entourage of nerids, cupon, cupids, tritons and others. Diana at her bath, located in the Hippocrene of Pegasus, attended by the nymphs, spied upon by Action and indeed Juba and the rape of Hylas by the nymphs, the last surrounded by the vign vignettes of the punishment of Cupid and the whole viewed by Cato. The unusual treatment of water in straight continuous lines, spade-like shapes of the faces and the rendition of the figures indicate that these three pavements were the work of one workshop as Tuvano noted long ago. They thus represent a single major installation designed for a specific suite of rooms. Uh, as I noted earlier, they've been assumed to be primary floors within the House of Venus and thus dated to the late second or at very early third century AD or even earlier. But it's clear 
from surviving records that any fl earlier flooring of the triclinium would have been destroyed uh, by this installation. Uh, and it also seems that the supporting structure of walls for the mosaic actually butts the walls of the dining room uh, and is therefore later. Beyond Volubilis, there are comparisons to be made with the suite of pavements in the northeast corner of the Nympharum Domus at Neapolis, modern Nabul in Tunisia, a house dated by numismatic evidence to at least after AD 316 with a coherent installation of pavements of similar construction. And here, a corner suite of two cubicula was approached through a fountain court, the ensemble of rooms located next to a triclinium in an arrangement reminiscent of that of the House of Venus at Volubilis. The rooms are decorated with scenes of nymphs bathing in the fountain of Pegasus, the flow of water uh, triggered by a kick from the horse's hoof, uh, and there are two panels featuring the Thessalian princess Amimone, uh, one illustrating her rape by Poseidon, the other showing her resisting the advances of a satyr. Unfortunately, the centre of the triclinium mosaic is lost, but you see here how very similar uh, these ensembles of, of, of rooms are, um, House of Venus on the left, and the, the boxed in red. And then if we look at the mosaic, uh, we can see that the Bath of Nymphs is very reminiscent of the mosaic of Diana in the House of Venus in composition, execution, and iconographic detail, the way the water is done, shapes of the faces, female figure shown with her back to the viewer, uh, and I think they're very comparable. And there are more examples uh, in that uh, area of Roman Africa at Althipuras to the southwest of Neapolis, very similar suite of rooms again. But we can go a bit wider than that and uh, compare uh, the mosaic representing the rape of Hylas uh, to the Opus Sectile pavement installed in a basilica on the Esquiline Hill in Rome by Junius Bassus, Consul Ordinarius for AD uh, 331. Uh, the scenes of the punishment of Cupid flanking the Hylas panel at Volubilis are unique in mosaic repertoire and have been regarded as typical of whimsical scenes of children appearing in unexpected roles, a fashion especially uh, prevalent in the fourth century, according to Catherine Dunbabin. The same combination of Venus, Diana, and Hylas appears in an inscribed mosaic pavement excavated in the villa of Maternus, who was the uncle of the emperor Theodosius, uh, at Caranque in central Spain. Uh, so this pavement is dated to the later fourth century AD. And we've got, I mean, it, it really is very, very, very like a different style, but same iconography. And as Janine Lanchard suggested for Kerang, we surely see at Volubilis and Nabel a taste in the decoration of private apartments for erotic scenes associated with water. Uh, and that link is uh, often further expressed by citing the rooms uh, around a fountain court. So compared with these installations across the Western Mediterranean region, the group of the three mosaics in the House of Venus is likely to have been installed, in my view, in the early fourth century AD. It's likely that we see uh, the work of two different teams of mosaicists in the principal rooms of the house, one of them specializing in mythological narrative in which the panels appeared as subtly colored paintings and the surrounding geometric ornament rather poorly designed in monochrome. The other workshop, on the contrary, specialized in highly colored geometric ornament with the figures appearing as vignettes within a series of dominant and complex geometric frames. And for this team, the design of the framing ornament outweighed the representation of the figures. And you see on the left here the two mosaics we've been looking at on the right above the tablinum where the fisherman was and another room which as far as I know had no sculptural display uh, at the other side of the uh, triclinium. 
These characteristics reflect profoundly di diverse approaches to the design of mosaic pavements, but not necessarily differences in dates. All these pavements could have been commissioned at approximately the same date as two separate programs of enhancement to the house, the commissions reflecting the varied functions and relative importance of the rooms. And given the patron's evident taste for wit, parody and humour, it seems in character for these very different trends in mosaic design to be commissioned within the same house. So to sum up, um, comparable material from Volubilis and beyond suggests that the House of Venus was occupied after the withdrawal of formal administration of the city of Volubilis by a highly educated and cultured resident with access to what must surely have been highly prized bronze sculptures of public figures uh, with local resonance. An enduring and consistent uh, taste for parody, some of it sexual, informs the decoration of all the public rooms. Uh, we see it again later. Uh, this is a detail of the circus mosaic uh, with the chariots drawn by geese and peacocks, a mosaic installed in front of the entrance to the triclinium, probably in the late fourth century as it compares well with examples from Carthage uh, of that period. I illustrate here a map with a very limited range of comparanda used for this study. I could put an awful lot more into here. Um, besides the sites in Africa and Spain, similar reuse of marble statues as part of a deliberate program of furnishing a residence with reference to the early history of a city is seen uh, very well known in 5th century AD Athens, and more recently the same phenomenon has been well explored in the public areas of various cities, including Aphrodisias and Ephesus, about which we'll hear in a moment. However, the redeployment of historic bronzes in this way is most unusual, as they were so often melted down to recycle the metal. In a substantial recent survey of statues in late antiquity, Bert Smith and Brian Ward Perkins found that nearly all inscribed bases were reused, over half of the surviving statues were reused, 65% of heads and 30% of busts, the latter particularly common uh, in the Western Empire. And in Smith's view, this very high level of reuse of statuary, which is of course overwhelmingly of marble, expressed a desire for cultural continuity rather than economy or laziness. It's very deliberate. A number of points of reference uh, suggest then a fourth century date for the visible decoration of the House of Venus. The comparable material is spread over the Mediterranean uh, from Megiddo in Palestine with a mosaic very similar in design to that of the Tablinum in the House of Venus, to Rome, central Spain, Spain, and less surprisingly to Carthage and the surrounding region. Even in this very focused and extremely limited study, the geographical spread suggests a pattern of cultural behaviour shared by a highly educated pagan or secular elite, which extended beyond the redisplay of antique sculptures to uh, sharing of designs uh, of mosaics uh, and, uh, and in other media. What we don't see at Volubilis is the use of sigma tables or the construction of apsidal rooms typical of late antique dining installations. Rather, we see the adaptation of an existing structure as indeed actually was normal practice for the period. And within the mansions of Volubilis, there are, there's much more of this, uh, uh, particularly uh, among the mosaics, though other installations of sculpture are lacking. Um, so it was by no means alone uh, within uh, the city. Um, the later phases of occupation of the House of Venus may thus perhaps be reevaluated, possibly as a residence of a late antique pagan collector, well-educated, interested in entertaining guests and steeped in the past history of his or her region, and most likely, in my view, with some personal connection to Carthage and the surrounding area. We can't exclude 
that the rooms in which the busts were displayed were actually used for sexual encounters. And a question arises as to whether the operation of the House of Venus in the fourth century AD was entirely a private matter, or whether we're actually looking at a very small exclusive brothel attached to the publicly accessible bath suite with provision for dining in the triclinium. Whatever the scope of this remarkable house, the social, sexual and cultural life of late antique Mauritania Tingitana was rather more vigorous and connected than its political history suggests. And we may recall here another of Jana's criteria for collecting a sense of openness and geographical as well as historical connectivity are required characteristics of a collector at any time, in any place, no matter how remote. Thank you. Not Saint Miklos. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. With, which leads us actually beyond antiquity again, uh, as it is an avarian um, treasure. Could I have? Yeah, coming back to another two case studies. The first, uh, as mentioned uh, before, already will be Ephesus again. The second is this um, late variant treasure from, from um, Notch St. Miklos. Um, when talking about case studies, we have heard uh, such uh, a, a big number of different approaches. Now we have a public space, and so we have not a person probably being a collector, a connoisseur, or whatever, uh, but a public space which is interesting in, in these terms. Uh, and thank you, yeah. And all, uh, <laughs> sorry, and all uh, the sculptures uh, we will find there. Uh, the, yeah, um, the area we were talking, we will be talking about in the next uh, minutes, is the harbor baths of Ephesus, um, which is sorry again, this missing the first. Yeah, um, the Austrian excavations in Ephesus began in 1895, thanks to Professor Otto Bendorf, who was a professor for classical archaeology in Vienna, who started the excavation later than the Germans did in Asia Minor, and also going to the emperor at that time, um, asking him for, uh, for funding for this excavation, uh, with the promise of bringing back some precious findings for the collection, again, of the treasures of the uh, emperor in Austria, uh, which was uh, the normal case in that time. It was officially a gift uh, from Sultan Abdul Hamid the second to the Austrian emperor, uh, the things which have been brought down in the first 10 years uh, of Austrian excavation. The first projects in Ephesus actually were big projects, not the Artemisian, which was found uh, several years before by John Turtlewood, but imperial projects, so to say, big uh, major uh, ruins like the big the the Grand Theater of Ephesus and the Harbor Baths, which were first of all thought to be uh, the Roman Agora and entitled that in the first excavation diaries. It was uh, so soon uh, clear that it is an, an harbor bath a gymnasium complex as uh, typical for Asia Minor. You see uh, to the, does it work? No, you cannot see it. There, to the west is the, the block, which is the, the bath, and uh, on the upper side you see clearly the palestra, uh, and another big uh, space uh, up there to the east, which is again a bigger palestra as a group of stoai called the stoai of Verulanus, who paid for that. We will concentrate on the palestra and first of all uh, on a very um, uh, exact structure which is called the marble hall, which is this exit right here. 
a space of 16 to 32 meters. You see here the first excavation plans. You see already mentioned Großes Gymnasium, which means the Haber Bath there. And you see uh, um, names like Nordgraben and Südgraben, which is a ditch just uh, drawn through this area to, to understand what it is. Uh, and that will explain what we have to come back later on uh, about the precise finding spots which are not existing and about the precise stratigraphy which is not existing, of course, in these early excavations. But, and that is the very important luck in terms of, of the Haber Baths, it obviously ends in the third century AD. So we have no later phase here, which might be important for the setting of this marble hall and the sculptures found within there. To the right, another sketch um, of the palestra. To the south, the room A1 is that uh, which we are interested in, the so-called marble hall in which the most um, sculptures have been found there. Again, the sketch compared uh, to, uh, to the actual uh, presence of the, of the uh, ruin there. Uh, again, the mentioning, there is a very interesting st structure and there's late antique houses of the 5th century um, AD in the northeast of the part of the palestra, which was obviously reused in late antique time uh, with very precious material, with pavimentum sectile, um, with things reused and reinstalled uh, in these houses. Uh, fortunately, the south West part obviously was given up completely after a destruction in the third century AD, which might go back to the famous earthquake which also destroyed the famous slope houses in Ephesus. And you see the impact of fire, um, for instance, in uh, the column, one of the columns pushed up from the propylon uh, to the west, uh, to the east, sorry, um, of the, so this would be the room D, the propylon um, of, the, uh, of the palestra and also a very nice detail in the bases, in the antigonic bases to the right, where a lizard is hunting a bee or uh, probably a flea, fly, uh, whatever it might be. Uh, the state of preservation of this marble hall was, uh, well, partly uh, interesting for the excavators there. You see the, the, the groundwater level, which has been a problem in that time. It was more an well, an opening uh, of this room, an emptying uh, of this room, rather than an excavation, of course, in these early years. Uh, several parts of architectural decorations have been found, several parts of sculpture um, has, have been found. And, of course, uh, at, at in, in the instance, uh, there was made an architectural reconstruction by Schorsch Niemann, who was architect of the time in the team of the Austrian excavation, who made a section, you see, we are looking into the, the stoa of the palestra, and to the left-hand side would be uh, the adjacent room of the so-called marble hall. Another reconstruction of the interior of this hall, which uh, seems very precious, very detailed. Uh, you see all the elements, all the articuli, um, all the columns and, and capitals of different orders, uh, even on the lower part, another solution for that. If we look closer to what we have in the marble hall, and if we <laughs> and if we look closer to what we have in the theatre, actually, um, we learn that uh, George Niemann, who was working on both places, the theatre and the marble hall, uh, was much uh, was introducing much material from the theatre to his reconstruction of the marble hall, which might not be the worst uh, idea, uh, as both of the structures seem to be contemporary, so late first century A.D. in the 90s of the first century A.D. But still, um, I also want to direct your attention to the sculpture standing there. So you have Lysippan arrows over there. You have an Apollon to the very left. That's not the sculptures found there, actually. But he was aware of the fact that there were sculptures and that there were reliefs we will see later on. Um, today's state of the preservation uh, shows the very few remnants of this uh, architecture which are still preserved. We have several blocks of architecture uh, here in the front to be seen. We have a sockle which was obviously uh, covered with marble revetment, um, still uh, bearing traces of, of fire, obviously, in that terms. Uh, we have uh, several blocks of architecture which might go to the marble hall uh, and which leads again back to the uh, reconstruction of uh, Georges Niemann. One of the capitals is preserved, which proves that the very complex um, connection of a pillar with two semi-columns attached to that, uh, which made the entrance from the palestra uh, to the marble hall. And up there, a part of the Pulvinus frieze, naming also the inscription, the, the Papa Bath was dated uh, with the name of the Gymnasiarchis in that time, uh, still leading to a, a certain Tiberius Aristion, who is known in, as mentioned before, the late first century AD. Uh, and at the first moment uh, in the excavation, um, people were happy and lucky uh, that all this uh, region was given up, first of all, in the third century AD and not used anymore um, in, in, uh, in comparison to other parts of the bath, as we have seen, uh, to the um, north 
east, as mentioned before, the houses of the fifth century uh, to the southwest, room B1 uh, to the very left lower corner here, was uh, reused again in the fourth century AD, called an atrium constantiniarum, uh, which meant that there might have been even the use of a bath still in the fourth century. So sneaking through this room B1, turning to the left at once and entering uh, the probably still existing bath, uh, but the corner to the north of it, the corner with the marble hall uh, was given up and even was uh, too bad preserved for John Turtlewood who wanted to find some uh, sculptures and obviously did some, uh, take some fragments, we will see that later on, uh, but he mentions in his diaries that it's too, too hard to work. Uh, good luck for the Austrians because they found uh, this very sockle and in front of it uh, the famous um, athlete from Ephesus uh, whom we have seen already and discussed, already broken in more than 200 fragments, lying actually in front of this very circle, which must have been um, the very place uh, of installment. So in the palestra, but at the very edge of the entrance uh, to the marble hall. It was again Otto Bendorf at once recognizing the type of the statue being known uh, in a series of, of um, Campana reliefs, one of them preserved in Vienna, showing exactly the situation we have in Ephesus. So a, a row, a series of statues in an architecture of a palestra, um, as uh, Ken mentioned yesterday, an athlete goes perfectly into the surrounding of a palestra, of course. To the right, the small scale statuette from uh, Boston um, with the at that time preserved uh, right hand, which shows that he's not uh, scraping himself, but rather cleaning the strigil uh, with his left hand. The focus of attention was of course brought back uh, to this uh, very statue, uh, because exactly 100 years after uh, finding the Ephesian athlete, uh, the Croatian one uh, was uh, found in the sea near the uh, coast of uh, Lochin. Uh, and to bring the two of them together was one of the great efforts of the, uh, of the, of the exhibition uh, mentioned again in Los Angeles uh, to see. And this is already something uh, which we heard in, in these days about collecting, about original, about copy and replica. So what is, what is the original? They are completely the same type, but they uh, have so many differences as you see uh, at the first sight. So which is the original, which is more precious than the other? Uh, but that is probably the topic of, of, another, of another talk or conference. The sockle is preserved, which is, I think, uh, one of the bare cases ever that the sockle and the very statue standing on that are preserved together, even with parts, at least, of an inscription naming a certain Claudius Fogianus, again leading to the end of the first century um, AD, proving that this might have been the original setting with the original sculpture for that very first phase of the Haber Baths and the Palestra. There's a series of other sculptures found not only in the marble hall, but in the entire area um, of uh, the, the bath. So we start with the objects of most uh, far away from the marble hall. This is from the propylon or the, the area of the propylon ahead um, of uh, Hermes, going back to the, uh, the, the polycleton type of, of Heracles, uh, probably the last version uh, used there with the wings on the head. Uh, so second century, probably AD, going back to the fifth century AD, and to the right of Praxitelian um, Satu with a flute, fourth century uh, BC would have been uh, the model with a long series of replica, replicas uh, preserved. And again, you see the traces of fire um, on the surface of this statue. There's also a fragment of, obviously, Apollos from Artemis Ephesia, so the top of the head uh, which uh, she was wearing there, which is interesting because the only marble replicas we have found uh, till now um, have been preserved in the Prytaneion, so in the very political center of the town. And to find another one uh, in the harbor baths is not easy to explain, and still it's just a fragment, and it's not sure that we have to expect the entire statue in that surrounding of this uh, public area here. Uh, not entirely clear where they have been found are these two monopodia, a later with a swan dated to the second half of the second century AD, and a strange statue of bees uh, in front of a palm tree. Um, again, not clear where they have to go to, but as they are monopodia, they would be rather be expected in, in an interior than uh, in the free palestra. And a lion, which has a clear fine spot in front of B1 again, so in the very corner of the palestra, which perfectly goes again uh, in an open space, which is dated also to the mid-2nd century AD. Finally, we come uh, to the interior of the marble hall itself. You see the group of, of uh, excavators of the first years in the middle, Otto Bendorf, to his left with the long beard. This is George Niemann, the architect. And you see here on the table, 
the face of uh, one of the uh, famous statues found there, uh, the boy with the goose. Uh, again, with a long discussion if this might be Boethos uh, or not. It, it might be uh, going back to an original of the third century um, BC anyway, uh, again being a Roman copy, being found on the border of the marble hall to the palestra, but uh, very probable coming from the interior. Then there is a series of more than 50 fragments in this uh, black stone, which is not basanite, but gray wax again. And these are the fragments which have been recognized by Fritz Eichler being part of the famous group of a sphinx slaughtering a boy, uh, which would have been the motive of the armrest of the throne of Zeus in Olympia. So a very prominent model, and also the faces are quite Phidian and quite classical uh, in these terms. So there's 57 pieces in Vienna, there's 14 pieces in London. Here we are, so John Turtlewood did find something actually and brought home, not knowing what it was, and it was like, I think they uh, the first question was answered with a no from, from Fritz Eichler in the 1930s, and only in 1957 they found the seven fragments, uh, which they could not explain, which go together with those in Vienna, um, to the reconstruction you see here. It has been two groups, uh, but not symmetrically, but two exact identical groups, so showing to the same side, uh, which is also interesting in terms of how to understand them in a display uh, in this so-called marble hall. And together with that, a fragment of two luteria, so big basins for washing hands, which is again a perfect thing to be found uh, in a bath or in a palestra. But again, interesting that this is the same material to question if they go, if it's two groups of sphinx and boy and two luteria, if they go somehow together. The so called striding poet, fifth century probably, uh, uh, head to Puscandia in. Uh, the severe style, if Gianfranco, this is existing at all. <laughs> but anyway, it would be fifth century again. And then again, fragments from two groups uh, called Heracles and, and the Centaur. It is Peter Bohl who claimed that it might be a Hellenistic original, second century BC. And the second group, from which is preserved only parts of the feet and, and leg, uh, legs of the two persons, might be a Roman copy. Uh, Ridgway uh, said that it's rather probable that it might be a Roman copy, a Roman eclectistic uh, copy, um, being made into a candelabra, into a lamp, because uh, they attached a, a tree trunk uh, in, in, the, in the background, makes it... Again, two groups, obviously, of bronze candelabras um, found there. And the motif is old, of course, going back to the third century, uh, probably BC, and is still living on in late antiquity, you see it contorned on the, on the upper right side here uh, of the fourth century AD. Together with that, another series of fragments of a bronze candelabra, uh, candelabra capital, uh, five uh, parts of, of lamps, and this is the reconstruction, how it goes today in the Ephesus Museum uh, in Vienna. So from First of all, the upper part is not so much original material, but again, from the lamp, uh, this seems to be uh, quite uh, the original one. Again, the dating is not uh, so easy for that, uh, but still we are, of course, all the times uh, in Roman imperial times and not um, earlier. Then there's a series of reliefs, which is interesting because they are quite small scale, and most of them are chi-sizing in a certain uh, way. Um, a fragment of, of a dancing manats. This is about 25 centimeters high, the left fragment. Uh, and it's not clear how it goes uh, together. There is uh, two fragments of an, again, archaistic relief showing probably Dionysus and the Horai, uh, very similar to that one known in the Louvre, which is much smaller, so the fragments in Ephesus are somehow bigger. And the probably most interesting and most intriguing in our question, again, of collecting, of remembering, of Greek original, um, is this fragment, abduction, uh, abduction of, a, of a woman, which is an exactly, and also in one-to-one in -one scale, copy of uh, the frieze of the Elysos Temple in Athens. So, second half of this century um, BC, not so many uh, things preserved. It was uh, built into a church in the 17th century. It was completely destroyed in the 18th century, and then there was an excavation uh, late 19th century. Some of the, of the reliefs uh, are preserved, some of them by chance also in Vienna, the other parts in Berlin and some fragments found in excavations are still in Athens today. Uh, the question was to whom this uh, temple uh, was dedicated, and uh, the, the scholars tried to find out that because of these reliefs, because of the uh, depictions on the reliefs, and there were uh, different ideas, uh, Artemis Akrotera, uh, and later on it was Michael Krome uh, proposing that it might be uh, for Zeus and Athena at the Palladium, this might be the reason why it still would be interesting for Romans uh, to to deal with uh, this very uh, temple, to deal with this very uh, relief. And you see uh, that the, uh, the relief is an 
actual uh, one-to-one scale copy of, of this um, um, of this freeze. The interesting thing is also the frame uh, that you can see. So it seems that the, the efficient one seems to be a single image, a single part of this freeze, of course, not the entire freeze, uh, being on display as not a painting, but as a, as a single element and not as the entire freeze going through. And it seems, as far as I know, to be the only copy of a fifth century relief uh, we have in this very precise way uh, here in Ephesus. Um, when discovering the marble hall and when discussing about all this marble bath, uh, 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 um, bath gymnasium complex in, in Asia Minor, it's always the discussion, what is this marble hall for? Is this an imperial room? So the term Kaisersaal uh, was used very early also in Austrian excavation. Uh, always the discussion if that is imperial cult in there. Uh, in terms of the Vidius gymnasium, mid-2nd century AD, uh, there was, uh, well, the idea that it, it was not an uh, imperial cult room because the, the altar is very much later on. Uh, the sculpture which was uh, brought in there is most the, the donators and not the emperor himself, but the donators showing themselves in, uh, in, in companion of the emperor, more or less. When we go back to the, uh, to the harbor bath, we have at least two or three fragments um, with a priest, a, a female priest of imperial cult with a, a famous crown with the busts. There is a second one uh, dated earlier in the 4th century AD by Inan and Rosenbaum, lately brought back to the late 2nd century AD, which would allow uh, for it to be in that very um, time and span of, of usage of, of this marble hall and not later on, 4th century would mean after destroying uh, of, this, um, of this area. And then a fragment of a diadem, of a bronze diadem, which might have been part of a marble statue anyway, showing somehow uh, the presence or at least uh, uh, a part of the function which might have been uh, imperial cult also in the marble hall. To sum up, um, these are most, not all, but most of the um, important sculptures uh, which have been found there. Most of them, again, as, as told before, in the marble hall. Uh, and the interesting thing is also to go back to the originals. So all of the objects seem to be imperial. 1st century AD, late 1st century AD, uh, beginning 2nd century AD. So that would be the time of erection of the harbor baths. So there's no Greek original, no import of anything which is older, but obviously a very strong wish to connect to all these different uh, times. Uh, and we can, of course, discuss the single elements if it's really 5th or 4th century um, BC in that time. But just to give you an overview of the probable uh, time span of the sculptures being on display here, um, not entirely clear is how to date uh, these archaistic reliefs um, uh, comparison with the, with the Dionysus and Torah, which would go back to the second century um, BC. Uh, again, in that time already doing as if it would be from the sixth century uh, BC. So it's uh, not difficult where to put that in terms of understanding uh, from a Roman point of view. And the other important question would be how to install all that in the marble hall. Because some of them are life-size, uh, like uh, Typus Candia, like uh, the Hermes, like the Striding Poet. Uh, so they might go into these niches, into these um, um, areas where already George Niemann uh, wanted to have some uh, prominent statues. But how to deal with all these small-scale uh, statues and, and sculptures, like the, the boy with the goose, like the candelabra, uh, and first of all, also the reliefs. Um, George Niemann uh, has proposed, you see that here in the background, to have some freezes, some freeze zones, more or less, in the, in the back wall of this Skene France, more or less, which he reconstructed here. Uh, but again, it's a very small scale type of reliefs. It's all of them, more or less, uh, leading back to archaistic times and how to imagine that. So how to imagine the setup um, of these objects uh, in, in the marble hall. Is that, in a certain way, uh, a sort of, of museum in terms of different times, different styles, different tastes, uh, anyway? Or is it just, again, market, just again, the things which are available, which are nice, uh, which look uh, good in that surrounding. And um, you see there also uh, this, this very small scale, uh, these fences um, on the pedestals of the columns preserved are traces and dowel holes um, um, showing that there must have been fences somehow in, in a certain time. So it seems probably that it was not open to the public all the time, but may have been a very, um, yeah, a, a room for special um, events more or less. So that might be uh, leading back again to the imperial cult, um, not so much to the, to the um, 
to the museum idea, so to say, but I have no idea how to work uh, together. So how the imperial cult would work together with all these different styles and areas, not being imperial propaganda at all, because it's just nice pieces uh, in that time. We leave um, Ephesus and go to Notch and Miklos, which was uh, in that days Hungary, which is today Romania, and which in very former days it was Austria, more or less, it was part of the Austrian Empire. And that's the reason why this treasure found 1799 finally ended up uh, in Vienna, um, found uh, by, by peasants there, uh, hidden there, and, and, and just, they, they just cut off small gold pieces, selling them for their private life. Uh, fortunately, somebody uh, got to know that there must be something in behind that, and then uh, this treasure was found. It's nearly 10 kilogram of gold. It's 23 vessels, and mostly all of the vessels are from 91 to 98% gold, so really uh, from the material already starting a very precious um, material. It is three groups in terms of, uh, of objects, and it's three groups probably also in terms of time. So it's late 7th century AD, 1st half, 8th uh, century AD, and 2nd half, 8th century AD, the different groups. And what is interesting to us is, well, a set of gold vessels. Uh, first of all, that it is from different times, and second, the iconography, which is uh, on there. In terms of decoration, it becomes quite clear that it must go uh, to the, uh, to the um, culture of the Avars uh, in the 8th century AD. There is this famous, we've talked about um, German uh, words before, Stäbchenranke, which I think is not translatable in any language of the world. So a certain type of decoration which is known from fibula and from belts uh, of the Avaran um, uh, culture, but uh, from nowhere else. You see a vessel with glass inlays. You have the small glass bubble there, and you see on spaces like here that the entire surface uh, was covered with blue glass, with dark blue glass, so the, the impression must have been a completely different one. So there is a very typical avar decoration and ornament on these uh, vessels, but then you see already uh, these uh, griffins on there, and that goes on uh, with the so-called bullhead cups, which are obviously lion heads, lion with, with horns, and that is something which seems in the first uh, moment to be uh, completely unknown. But when going back to the Achaemenid period, there are lines with horns and even famous, for us, famous objects like the Alexander sarcophagus uh, on, the, on, the, on the roofing, so to say, the, the, the water spouts, but rather with horns from goats, so not from, from uh, bulls with uh, this uh, type here, but from goats. And again on the Arapakis, so also on the altar, on the inner altar of the Arapakis, there is also a lion with horns uh, being there. Later on, um, bowls with crosses, uh, second half of 8th century, so Christian um, influence, obviously, you have also in the inscription, which is partly in, in, in runiform uh, Turkish language, partly in Greek letters, uh, again, a language that we do not understand, we can read it but not understand it entirely, but there have you on this left-hand side, um, uh, a starogram also, so really Christian influence there uh, in terms of, of decoration, and probably the most interesting um, object, a flask, which was then changed into a jar uh, when adding a, han a handle with these uh, four medallions, which show exactly um, the, the, the range, more or less, of iconography uh, which we have here. The upper two medallions, there would be uh, uh, a warrior riding, riding to the left with a male uh, wearing with, with two um, defeated enemies, one uh, in his hand, more or less, the other you see up there the head of the already killed uh, enemy uh, hanging on the horse, and to the right side, a person riding on a panther, whatever it is, a winged panther with a man's face actually uh, turning back. Uh, this is motifs we know from Sassanid art, which in that time is already over for more than two generations, so it's already going back to an old and not, more, and not any more existing uh, tradition. A uh, griffin... Um, uh, Chasing animals, well, this is, this is an image we know from Greek, from Roman, from Scythian, from even from Byzantine art, so more or less from every time. Whereas the lower right would be um, like a Ganymede uh, typology, if that would not be a woman uh, raped by this, what might be an eagle. There's just one parallel, which is a Russian um, vessel showing the same, um, the same topic and the same motif. So the question is, uh, obviously, first of all, we have 
high quality in terms of material. We have highest quality in terms of craftsmanship, of making all these elements. We have a high niveau of, of, of education, obviously, and we have, in that, in that sense, probably a collection of different iconographies. So going back to ancient art, to Sassanid art, to Achaemenid art, to local things, to Byzantine, so to the east and to the west, the question would be where these images have been uh, available at that time, how they uh, might have been uh, brought down to that period, and of course, why? that very person, whoever it might be, probably a, a Duke of the Avars, uh, why uh, he has brought that all together. And third question would be how to use that. Of course, I mean, we must expect in that case again that these vessels have been used, uh, not only shown, but used uh, uh, as is shown by, by the uh, uh, circumstance that most of the flasks have been changed into jars. Uh, so again, how to talk about that, how to, to connect these uh, foreign, these very old and foreign images and, and iconography to the uh, very Avaran uh, cult. So to come to an end, it's again more questions than answers, um, I'm, I must confess. Uh, for Ephesus it's the same, uh, so how does a marble hall work? What is it in that sense of the world? Uh, of course, with the problem that we are lacking stratigraphy, that we are lacking the exact fine spots, and that we do not know exactly uh, from what period uh, the objects would be, but still we have an end in probably the late third, the, the last third of the third century AD, which makes it somehow in 150, 200 years a quite exact where to where to deal and where to search for. Uh, and in the case of Notch and Miklos, a completely different approach and a completely different group but also a completely different time period and culture uh, who uh, definitely works differently with our ideas, our ideas of, of collections and, and museums. Thank you. Passo la parola a Walter Cooperi che perché si introduce la sezione, eh, eh, tutte le volte no, sì, mettetevi d'accordo, sì, per introdurre la parte del collezionismo e di queste giornate intense che riguarda l'aspetto di storia dell'arte, per cui post antico in generale, come mi è stato garbatamente suggerito. Perfetto, Grazie. allora io chiamo Donatella Pegazzano. che di collezionismo a Firenze si è occupato non solo per Bindo Altoviti e per il Cinquecento, ma anche per l'Antico, e cedo la parola. Per creare un ponte tra gli antichisti e i modernisti, in realtà. E i medievisti. Sì. Eh, grazie agli organizzatori per avermi chiesto di presiedere a questa sessione. Adesso passiamo nelle epoche medievali e rinascimentali e infatti inizia Susanne Witekind dell'Università di Colonia con un intervento sull'esposizione dei tesori nelle chiese. Thank you. Grazie. Devo... Thanks, um, many thanks to Gabriela Ziucci and to Walter Cooperi for organizing this conference on collections on a core subject and intersection of different disciplines, including medieval art uh, history, which is my special field. And thanks for inviting us to such a marvelous site and place, which as an archive represents another kind of collection and ordering the world. Um, I decided yesterday to switch to English and but I just had time to go give a very rough a translation of my first too long paper, so please, I apologize in advance. First, a short introduction. Uh, in his book on collectors and collections, um, Christoph Pomian, already, uh, already quoted, um, defined a collection as an ensemble of natural or artificial objects, temporary or for long, withdrawn from the economical cycle, protected and assembled at a special place to be seen. Can we subsume um, medieval church treasures, as Julius von Schlosser did in his influential book on Wunderkammern in uh, 1908, as collection, these me medieval treasures as collections or as their forerunners? We will hear more tomorrow on this 
specific topic from Dorothy Diemer. The term church treasure has a double meaning, or um, thesaurus ecclesiae. Firstly, a spiritual one, as it signifies the Gnadenschatz, or the heavenly treasure, accumulated by Christ, the saints, and all the ecclesiastics, and the virgins and saints, by their sacrifices and by their virtues. This thesaurus ecclesia is administered by the church and its officials for the salvation of the, the faithful. Secondly, the treasure means the material treasure, which includes all properties of the church, its, its rights, lands, incomes, and ornamenta ecclesiae. From the ninth century onwards, the meaning shifted to the letter, to consecrated vasa sacra and liturgical vestments, reliquaries, curtains, and books. And since the 12th century, this term was also used for the place where these objects were stored for the treasury. Vowing formula of the sacristan, the tesarius, or the custos, often written down together with the treasurer's inventory in gospel books, underline the obligation of the custos to beware the treasure from misuse, from losses, thefts, and from being sold away. In so far, the precious treasury objects were therefore withdrawn from economic exchange, or should be withdrawn, were assembled and protected in special places, they fulfill most of Pomian's criteria. But what about their visibility? A similar question Kenneth Lepertin arose yesterday. Where, when, and to whom have these treasures been displayed during the Middle Ages, in the ages before diocesan treasury museums were founded or opened up? To answer this question, or um, could it be experience these treasuries in the Middle Ages as a collection at which events? And yeah, are there alterations, changes in, within the Middle Ages about these centuries from the high to the later Middle Ages? To answer these questions, I will first, first look at written sources of the high Middle Ages, treasure inventories and chronicles that describe the Ornamenta Ecclesia quite well and tell us where they were used and preserved. In a second step, I will look at preserved treasury storage places from the 12th to the 15th century onwards. Altars, sanctuaries, sacristies, and treasuries. The third part will focus on the display of treasures at the high altar. Today, we can hardly imagine the riches of the medieval church furnishing and treasures, as most churches underwent several renovations, were rebuilt, plundered in war times, resolved per, uh, by secularization, that most of their treasures were melted down or at least dispersed. Therefore, it is helpful to use written sources to reconstruct the former feature of the ornamenta ecclesia of medieval churches. Let's first look at the treasury inventories, edited by Bernard Bischoff in 1967, but he stopped at the 13th century and was still lacking the continuation of these inventory editions. These um, inventories follow diverse orders, often starting with Vasa Sacra, crosses are followed as so, uh, to speak, chalices and patterns, then followed by crosses, vessels or censers, pixides, candelabra, and corone. Most, including gospel, uh, uh, most are written down in gospel, or, or they are including gospel books because they are, were needed and other liturgical books needed for the uh, celebrating of mass. Others begin with the paraments, with palia, ataris, casule, cortine, et tapezie, vexile, etc. Or they list the reliquaries with the relics, and some of them describe the ornamenta of each altar with a whole setting there. And again, some of them tell us just their weight in gold or silver, the material value, the because they functioned as a financial reserve or depot, a bank of the institution. Um, I just I don't explain the, the example, but just to have to, to illustrate what. Uh, these inventory include, do include not only mobile objects, but also fixed ones, antipendia, 
some monumental crosses or coronae. These are these loitering coming from above, fixed in the huge coronae with light candles on, up to 72 candles. Sometimes, um, here is the Mainz Cathedral inventory is very detailed, as it tells us about the very famous Banner, Banner cr Cross, mentioned in the folio before, um, that it was very in rare times exposed. It was only if the, pr the, the king was present or a very other uh, high aristocratic person, or to face like Pasha, uh, to the Dantativitas Domini, or on the, uh, when the pontifex just tells the people to give the device to ex um, expose it. And it's exactly described where it should be exposed, let's say it's on a trabea, um, where no one could, could get close to it, because it was from purely hard, pure gold. So it was so richly worth it that it must be sheltered. Just one example. And, but it uh, continues in the description that there were other objects from silver or um, deorata only put on to fe uh, special feasts, Pasha, Pentecost, Dedicazione Ecclesiae, or the uh, feast of the main patron, Mar Mar uh, St. Martin, to, in Nativitas Salvatoris, ante altare pendebat, so with many other uh, things named Afterwards, so it's a special decoration for the high altar to special feasts, an ensemble of things exposed to this special event on it. So, um, and some of these objects were preserved, the uh, sources tell us, in or at the altar itself, not in a separate room, other room. Often the donators of the objects were remembered. Um, for example, here at Magdeburg, the Richburgis. We don't know who it was, if it was an aristocratic person or just a burg. But uh, others tell us more from uh, when I, we go further on to the chronicles. Um, to add, um, if we name the donators of the objects, if they were remembered in these inventories, their memory was guaranteed not only by the liturgical orations for the souls, but even by the objects themselves. This point makes us aware, unlike modern collections, medieval treasuries or treasures are mostly not collected by a person or institution, here the church or maybe officials, but gained or gathered over times by more or less accidental donations. They come from outside. The chronicle of the Benedictine Abbey in Zwiefalten underlines this memorial aspect in several times. Ortlieb's chronicle, written in 1138, reports the founding of the monastery, very detailed. He describes the altars with their relics, then he lists the donations, mainly land, but sometimes cape or textiles, textile antipenia, given from, mostly from clerics or monks. Costly mantles and robes and curtains from lay people, from the high aristocracy, from them even precious gold and silver objects and relics. I'm sorry that I didn't get the, the Latin translation here because I just forgot to take it with me. So um, I just named Bertolt the Younger from Spursbeck. This is one of the few reliquaries that were preserved still in Zwiefalten in the treasury. And it's a relic brought from Jerusalem and with a very complicated history because the abbot and so he met another person and he died and before he died he gave it to another his companion and at least it went it came to three thousand. So and they tell us as well where they have been used. It was used as a processional cross. So and we have a, not only the origin of the object and how and we um, the gold for it was donated by the monk Otto of Stolzlingen and the Zwiefalten sister Sophie and Salome of Detting, to whom we don't know anymore, have, don't have any more information. So women, lay people, monks themselves, or relatives and other people. And they give the, only the gold, and the relic was the most important thing brought in by this um, Bert of the Younger um, yeah, uh, Bened, um, benefactor of the Abbey of Zwiefalten. And it was just another, it's following in the, they have different crosses and the most important one is 
presented Semper on the high altar, with a, and then the description of the relics is following. Okay. Um, I think I it should be one more. This is more detailed, just to show um, they had relations um, which are shown within the objects preserved or gained in the uh, monastery to Poland, to Bohemia, to Sophie Herzogin from Moravia, um, to her si uh, sister, Vicenza, and they gave, uh, uh, the sister, the, the women gave money to build up the, construct the refectory for the lay brothers and the dormitory on their own costs. Or, so they have mm, lots of information of different kinds of donations, and in between these, the objects, the textiles and vessels and others. Um, these are, yeah, just, and very, oh, just uh, detail, very fine descriptions in which way these mantles were made with gold, and I don't know the specific, I don't know what it means, how to say it in English. So the, the special manner in it was how it was made, is even described, or the, the colors and the ornaments with gold uh, stairs, um, um, in, the, in the way the folk in the Far East is making its textiles. So it's a, um, the rarit rarity or uh, is exposed. So, okay. Um, no, I have to give, I'll stay here. In the, in, um, just to the uh, chronicle of Petershausen, near Constance. And this chronicle uh, is described in very, the, uh, is, this chronicle describes in detail the donations of the venerated founder, Bishop Gebhardt of Constance, uh, died in 1995. The high altar, clad in gold and decorated with silver, below a silver ciborium and a corona, which later abbots, so the um, chronicle told us, were sold, uh, later abbots sold for different reasons. Justify, here the chronicler is justifying this selling of the treasure during a hunger crisis, but he condemns it in the case of a semiotic abbot who is buying, tries to buy his uh, position, and he criticizes it when it was sold just for buying land. Gebhardt's rich donations made the status of the privileged monastery visible. The destruction of these donations causes cause a loss of history and identity, as the chronicle demands. Even more, when in 1159, a fire destroyed the whole church and its, tre its treasures. For us, the report gives further information. At the high altar, the Philippus arm reliquary and several other reliquaries were, have been kept. A pending golden vessel for the host and a pending relic crucifix was, were burned as well on this place as all paraments and treasures of the sacristy. These written sources show us that the Ornatus Ecclesia was partly mobile, partly fixed or belonging to specific altars, mainly the high altar. For th some feasts, specific objects were taken from the sacristy and displayed on the high altar or carried along in processions, mainly crosses, vexilla, candelabra, and the gospel book. As the high altar is usually positioned in the eastern part of the church, east of the stalls of the monks or canons, who were separated from the lay people in the nave by the root screen, the high altar and its decoration with all its artifacts was visible only for the convent, not for the lay people. Even the processions usually led uh, through the church and the, the cloister and the adjacent uh, chapels only for the regation days through town. Until the late Middle Ages, even then, only canons and monks participated in these townward um, uh, processions. Ways. Therefore, the church treasure was seen only partly, seldom, rarely, liturgical, embedded, and addressed to the possessing religious community. So. My second point, storage places for the treasure. The Chronicle of Petershausen tells us that relics, relics and other precious objects were kept at the high altar. We don't know how, uh, but in which way, because the Petershausen monastery is burned down. But the high altar at St. Elizabeth at Marburg from the 1290s might give a model. Below the high altar, there's a chamber 
which can be entered via steps from the eastern side, from the back of the altar. It's a, no, sorry, one too far, this one. A sacred and very well protected room is below the altar, today used as a stock for postcards, etc. <laughs> I, I wanted to take a photo, but it was not easy. <laughs> the most common form uh, for, to um, preserve the um, sacrament and the relics are separate niches in the eastern wall behind the high altar. Here, Waltenberg and uh, Lahn, for example, where um, now the high altar is a baroque high altar, but the um, former high altar from the 1290, uh, around uh, 1300, is preserved or was just exhibited in the Städel Museum at Frankfurt, where the different, the shrine belongs to Braunfels, the Madonna in the middle to Munich, and the, uh, the wings to the Städel Museum. So this is the dispersion of the object and the trying to put it, them together. Again, at this, another example, at the Cistercian Abbey, Bad Oberan, we find two decorated cupboards from the 13th century, uh, from the, around 1300. A recent conservation report made plausible um, that they, they were for longer partly enclosed in a stone walled screen and therefore wet, quite wet for a long time. Because of its Eucharistic program, the richer one will have preserved the hoss on the left-hand side, pattern and chalices, um, as long as the, uh, for, then the uh, sacrament uh, tabernacle was erected in the end of the 14th century. And at the other, some more simpler one, um, the further liturgical objects or relics might have been kept. And if they were not exposed, so uh, in the shrine niche on the high altar, you can see that they are empty in the middle now. We don't know what they have been used for and probably to expose on some events the relics of the, or the treasures of the church. Um, sorry. Um, an important place where, no, sorry, it's just, Again, an important place where ornamenta and treasures were normally kept is a sacristy, placed aside the sanctuary to which only the celebrants, priest and diacon and the custos had access. The entrance to the sacristy is often protected by heavy oak doors with metal fitting and locks. Here again, Marburg with different covered niches and chests and the Elizabeth shrine just seen behind. But it's, uh, it's not normal that these a shrine is preserved in this way in the same place, but it's the best interior I could find. Since the end of the 12th century, in some places we find separated treasury rooms. Bamberg, at Bamberg Cathedral, the sacristy is situated north of the Peter's chancel at the east. Um, it contains an altar with a small window above uh, where you can see into the transept. Here the reconstruction of, of the liturgical use of the uh, from Kosh. Clemens Kosch, in uh, 12, uh, 2015, published. The treasury can be reached only via the sacristy, again protected by two strong locked doors. Its window is grilled, a guard room is below. Only the Kunigunden reliquary was kept at the Kunigunden altar at the east of the Georgenkor, sending its salvific rays through an oculus over the city, as you can see there. A similar concept we can find at St. Cunibert, at Cologne, in the 12th, 20s. And this is again, a uh, yeah, thing uh, Clemens Kosch marked. While the sacristy is situated in the northern side of the apse, the treasury is hidden within a huge pillar. One needs a ladder to climb up there. You can see the, um, the opening on the left, um, in the left picture. You, have to, you need a ladder to climb up there till now. A wall painted not niche, besides the high altar, demonstrates which relics were kept in the tiny room behind. And it's really a very, very tiny room. While the salvific rays again could stream through the oculus to the, into the sanctuary, into the church. The separation of the treasures from the sacristy might indicate a shift in the meaning of treasures treasures and their order in high medieval churches. The sacristy um, comp um, comprises then 
only liturgical vasa sacra and vestments stored in the sacristy as a dressing room for the clergy, and the treasures, the other treasures, mainly reliquaries and other valuable things preserved in the treasury. For the later, later Middle Ages, inventories may strengthen this hypothesis. In 1343, the canon Otto von Rhein of Rheineck wrote down the inventory of Constance Cathedral when a new custos, Johann von Ladenberg, took up his post. The long list, beginning with the old shrines of the saints, followed by crosses, monstrances, gold and silver vessels, ovastrationes, ostrich eggs, and crystal objects, um, they lack chalices, patterns, gospel books, and paraments. So we can conclude from this list that the letter were stored in a separate place, probably the sacristy. In a younger inventory from 1500, ordered by the cathedral chapter and written by a professional notary, the treasures from Constance of Constance Cathedral were listed following the numbered cupboards and shelves in the new treasury as the former Nicholas Chapel, similar to the order of the archive around here, alphabetical order in this case. In the inventory of ba uh, Bale Basel Cathedral from 1477, is some, uh, we find a similar structure. It starts with a golden antipendium, with, which was donated by Emperor Henry II, who died in 1022, was dedicated to the de cathedral in, at the so for in the 11th century. And it was stored there in a special box, while other reliquaries, monstrances, crosses and statues, etc., are kept in the new cupboard, which was donated by a canon of Basel Cathedral, Johann Hanfstengel. Many of the treasury objects of the 15th century were reported as donations of canons, town councillor families, or noblemen at Basel. The coat of arms of the, on these monstrances document this fact. But um, inventories by naming and objects by coat of arms strengthen, uh, both strengthen the memory, memoria of persons or families, or individuals or families. So the objects tell stories if they are presented on the high altar on feast days. The separation um, of the liturgical objects, Vasa Sacra, from the reliquaries and the greater focus on the latter may reinforce, be reinforced by the new form of ostensio reliquarum or heitumsweisung. For the first time, it is documented at Aachen um, in 1312, in the crisis of the legitimacy of the German king adopted for the presentation um, for the uh, relics of the Holy Empire at Bale in 1315, and then in Nuremberg, and following by Prague at uh, uh, Charles IV in 1350. In these Haltungsweisungen, or Ostensiones Reliquarum, for the first time the folk is addressed, the pilgrims are addressed, and the clergy is acting with the relics, relics on a stage, as you can see in, up, in the upper part of the um, prints. So my last point, displaying treasures on the high altar. Not until the late, uh, late Middle Ages, or I should say, oh. I don't know what's happening. Um, I will just go on. It's a temporary um, installation. The computer might run out. Um, not until the late Middle Ages we can get more in, uh, detailed information when and how treasures were exposed on the high altar or taken along on processions. So, uh, Ulrich Riechenthal's illustrated chronicle of the Council of Constance of, of the year uh, 1415 to 17 um, shows soon uh, Pope uh, Martin the uh, fifth celebrating Christmas Mass uh, uh, or a nativity mass on the high altar of Constance Cathedral, where Sorry, then? We, we lost the yeah, no. Uh, We're okay. For, sorry. No, no, I don't mind. It just takes longer then. <laughs> there was a countdown to that. Yeah. <laughs> place, uh, celebrating, for example, the uh, uh, mass at the high altar of Constance Cathedral, where then two bust reliquaries and the Pelagius shrine were placed or exposed, similarly uh, during the consecration rites for Martin V. 
um, the processional of Constance Cathedral, written in uh, 1517, informs us for the first time that on several procession relic shri processions, relic shrines or bust reliquaries were carried along, um, and they needed uh, they need young clerics to carry the bust reliquaries because they're quite heavy. The cathedral ceremonial of Canon Hieronymus Brillinger at in Basel, 1517, again, documents this practice for the Corpus Christi procession only. But on the feast of the church dedication, the relics of the cathedral were displayed on the high altar at Basel. In 1520, when Basel at, uh, and the Eidgenossenbund confirmed their contract, affirmed their contract, the golden antepennium of Henry II was exposed on the high altar together with the, with the relics of the saints. The high altar of the cathedral is becoming the setting or scenery for a political act. Um, okay. I would need the next. Per <laughs> continuare, no? I'm sorry. Bisogna andare a chiamare di nuovo. Sorry. Sorry. How many? <laughs> uh, no, the very uh, first four more and then. I'm ready. <laughs> Slides, but yeah. Fare il computer e guardarlo sul computer. No, se non funziona. Ah. Ah. Oh, grazie. <laughs> okay, but even more, the high altar stage at ba Basel Cathedral reminds me to the. Um, so you, here is the reconstruction. We have preserved uh, in the rear, um, year 1500. We have a, a description from the Bayer Cathedral how to place the cathedral treasure on the high altar for feast days. Therefore, a small extra platform was used. The golden antepennium was placed in the middle, flanked by bust reliquaries altern alternating with saint statues and framed by the ar two arm reliquaries. Below or in front of these monstrances, crosses and smaller objects in an approximately symmetrical arrangement. Such arrangements are comparable to the presentation of the relics in Haltums Blättern around 1500. I don't know the ostensio reliquarum papers, I don't know, prints. But even more, um, the high altar stage at Bayer Cathedral reminds me to the Lüneburg uh, Golden Tafel, as both present the golden antipendier in the center, surrounded by many reliquaries and precious objects. The golden, taf the golden tafel was made, uh, or golden panel, was uh, made for the high altar of the Benedictine Abbey of Church St. Michael's in Lüneburg. Uh, God, this abbey was uh, founded around, uh, around 950, nearby the ducal uh, castle of the, on the Kalkberg, above the later town. The monastery was solved when the town, in 1371, defeated the Duke of Braunschweig-Lüneburg and demolished the castle. The, so they transferred the monastery down to the town. The monks, and from this former um, St. Michael's Church above on the Kalk, uh, Kalkberg, this antepennium, golden antepennium, as we have seen in Bay, uh, Basel, um, comes from, came from. The monks took the treasure 
and uh, their archive with them to the refounded Abbey Church, which was consecrated in 40, uh, 1408. For this new Gothic Hall Church, uh -huh. okay, sorry, I matched up the direction. No, correct. A new Gothic Hall Church, um, a huge Reredos, was made by excellent artists. In this, the treasures of the former Abbey Church were gathered, preserved, and on high feasts exposed in, a, in the shrine, flanked by gilded sculptures, as you have seen before, of the saints. The outer rings uh, show the crucifixion and its old testament type, the brazen serpent, and the inner give a narration of the life of Christ in 36 scenes, and these are preserved in the Landesmuseum Hannover. Probably the liturgical practices of the former abbey of the, on the Kalkberg were not totally transferred to the new church of St. Michael in the town. I tend to regard the very specific and new form of presenting the treasure within the Reredos as a wish to demonstrate the seniority of the moved institution, its unity and its riches, which were kept even if some altars and rites belonging to them were skipped. So the altar became the visual guarantee for the history, the institutional continuity, the rank and importance of St. Michael's Abbey. The treasure in the shrine was robbed several times in the 17th century, but a 15th century drawing still demonstrates the former riches of this Lüneburg altar. In the center of the antependium with the Majestus Domini and the Agnus Dei between um, the, we have the, and the 12 apostles, the antependium, the former antependium. It is surrounded by 22 compartments, those at the sides slimmer than those above and below the golden panel. It is flanked by two arm reliquaries from the 12th century and two overstruziones, which Duke Bernard donated 1432, and which show his coat of arms as do the virgin's busts above. <coughs> um. After being robbed, the remaining treasures were rearranged. Here I show some of these very precious examples in the, like the Amber Madonna, of, uh, now in the Kestner Museum at Hannover. Unlike the temporary arrangement of the treasures on the high altar at Basel, the golden panel presents a permanent, although, or the golden altar presents a permanent, although only sometimes visible, safekeeping of the whole treasure. It includes liturgical objects like chalices and gospel books or crosses, as well as monstrances, reliquaries or statues. Probably there was a mechanism on the back of the corpus, shrine corpus, that allowed us to open the compartments and to extract the needed objects for liturgy, for this purpose, similar to the Reredos at Bad Doberan and Altenberg. I don't have a photograph of them to conclude. Um, we come back to the opening questions. Are medieval treasuries, treasures collections in the sense of Pomian or in a wider sense? In my talk, I show that the composition of treasures underwent transformations from liturgical objects, vasa sacra, and liturgical vestments to relics, reliquaries, and precious objects. Treasury objects lost their belonging to specific altars. They became part of the church treasure, collected and stored in a specific room. This goes along with the segregation between the sacristy on one hand and the, where the priests prepared themselves for the mass and where the vasa sacra and liturgical vestments were therefore stored and on the other hand the treasury as an extremely protected room for the storage of valuable things. To both the access was restricted to clerical or monastic officials, no public. Um, and only very few objects of, these, tre of this tre these treasures were frequently in use. Most of them were displayed only at very rare events on, and only on the high altar, on feast days or the consecration or for consecration rites or the visit of a pope or a king maybe. Visible only for the partici uh, participants of the liturgical celebration, the prize, the dean, the convent, the clergy, and presented and experienced as the property of the religious community assembled there. They are witnessing their history preserved in the objects on the altar. The Haltungsweisung, the Ostensio Reliquarum, Schlosser had a mind in 1908, 
was a very special and rare exception, taking place only a few, at a few churches in the whole Roman Empire, and not even every year, but as example, for example, in Aachen and so on, oh, every seven years, in a seven years course. But it was the only event where lay people could get a glance of the church's treasures, mainly its reliquaries. Therefore, the question, if the medieval treasures were collections, has to be denied, and so far these treasures were not kept for display, but kept in small rooms with small grilled windows, often difficult to reach. And different to that of our conference poster, and this is, seems to be a more visionary image of the treasures Emperor Maximilian donated to different churches, the churches of the empire. Um, treasuries had no public to address. But to, at another point, medieval treasures were not even collected but by chance required, by accident donated or lost by fire. They had no maker or no collector. To take up the point uh, Jane Pfeiffer made yesterday, it seems to me more fruitful to trace, chance, uh, to trace changes in the contemporary terms, like thesaurus, what it, it means, the semantic of the term, as um, Cor Philip Cordes already pointed out, in the composition of the te uh, te treasures, which underwent great transition, or um, in their places, their functions as witnesses or monuments of the his institutional history they are belonging to, or as demonstration, as a demonstration of personal or familiar influence, that means of power that is demonstrated within these objects. Thanks. Grazie, sì, questo intervento pone molti interrogativi, eh. per esempio quanto i tesori dei templi antichi, quanto dell'uso di accumulare e di inventariare gli oggetti nell'antichità passi anche nelle chiese medievali e poi quanto i tesori eh, delle chiese influenzino poi il collezionismo reale o viceversa, insomma poi ne parleremo. Allora io chiamerei a parlare Valentina Conticelli che è eh, responsabile e curatrice del tesoro Mediceo presso il Museo degli Agenti di Firenze e eh, da tempo si occupa di collezionismo Mediceo, ricordo il suo bellissimo libro sullo studiolo di Francesco I de Medici e la mostra recente che mi dice è stata eh, prorogata di splendida minima al Museo degli Agenti di Firenze. Bene, buonasera a tutti, spero che mi sentiate bene, eh, desidero ringraziare moltissimo gli organizzatori del convegno per l'occasione che mi hanno concesso di potervi eh, esporre alcuni aspetti del lavoro che ci, eh, ha portato mie, e i miei colleghi alla realizzazione della, della mostra attualmente in corso e ringrazio moltissimo anche gli oratori che mi hanno preceduta per i molti spunti che hanno offerto che rischierebbero di gonfiare il mio intervento a dismisura perché mi sono, sono aperte eh, finestre continue cercherò di mantenere il cammino che avevo previsto anche se alcune, eh, alcune eh, insomma ehm, qualche strada laterale si aprirà inevitabilmente credo allora eh, ecco la mostra è sentito la splendida minima piccole sculture preziose dalle collezioni medice e dalla tribuna di francesco I al tesoro granducale ed è aperta eh, fortunatamente ancora fino all'8 gennaio e quindi sono molto felice di potervi ancora invitare a vederla per chi non lo avesse fatto. Ehm, vi dicevo che il mio intervento prende spunto dalle ricerche che sono state effettuate per, eh, in questa occasione e eh, eh, che sono state condotte da me insieme a Riccardo Gennaioli, Fabrizio Paolucci e con la partecipazione anche eh, molto importante di una grande specialista delle piccole sculture preziose nell'antichità che è Elisabetta Caggetti. Ciascuno di noi ha affrontato un aspetto specifico della collezione del Museo eh, degli Argenti, il motivo eh, che ora non 
non si chiama più così, si chiama tesoro dei granduchi, quindi già eh, diciamo, eh, chiariamo questo eh, eh, elemento, anche se continua, ovviamente eh, per me è difficile ecco, separarmi, quindi scusatemi se eh, farò confusione ogni tanto, però le due cose si equivalgono. Ecco. E, vi dicevo, ciascuno di noi ha affrontato una, una, appunto, la collezione e... Ehm, quello che si è cercato di costruire intorno ad essa con questa mostra da un punto di vista specifico, eh, i miei colleghi archeologi Fabrizio e Elisabetta hanno collocato le nostre sculture all'interno della classe delle piccole sculture pre preziose eh, dal punto di vista proprio dello studio eh, del, delle opere, Riccardo si è occupato invece del, della eh, formazione della collezione e io del contesto di queste opere, dove stavano, a cosa servivano, chi le usava. Quindi in questo caso rispetto agli interventi precedenti abbiamo un collezionista quanto mai ossessivo, abbiamo una collezione specifica e un luogo preciso, molto paradigmatico del, del, del collezionismo cinquecentesco che è la tribuna degli uffizi. Quindi eh, eh, saremmo in teoria veramente all'interno del paradigma. Cercherò invece di muovermi io nei, nei limiti di questi eh, concetti paradigmatici perché in realtà eh, la tribuna eh, è, un posto, è un luogo eh, fortemente polisemico, ha avuto un'evoluzione molto lunga e sicuramente eh, l'aspetto che noi conosciamo meglio è quello che ci viene offerto dal momento tardo barocco e settecentesco, mentre anche se del momento proprio aurorale orale della sua nascita, sappiamo molte cose, ci sono ancora aspetti che eh, meritano ulteriori indagini ed è di, questo, di questi aspetti delle mie ricerche che cercherò di darvi eh, alcune, eh, alcuni elementi. Allora, vediamo come funziona questo. No, allora, per andare avanti, mh, più, scusate, ho qualche difficoltà. Di qua. E questa parte, benissimo. Le splendenti sculturine in pietra dura svolgevano un ruolo di primo piano nel collezionismo di antichità di Francesco I e soprattutto nell'allestimento della sua straordinaria e amatissima Camera delle Meraviglie, la tribuna. La tribuna costituisce il nucleo originario e pulsante della galleria della Galleria degli Uffizi, fino alla seconda metà del Settecento. Essa fu concepita come una favolosa caverna dei tesori, è erede dello studiolo di Palazzo Vecchio ed è nata per esporre i naturali, i mirabilia e i preziosi di Francesco. Dettagliate e ricchissime testimonianze archivistiche attestano lo sforzo delle botteghe della galleria che si trovavano intorno alla vedete al numero 13, ottagonale. Intorno ad essa moltissime botteghe dove artigiani e artisti lavorarono tra il 1582 e 87 insieme a Francesco stesso che fu assoluto protagonista, proprio c'è cioè un'identità fortissima tra il collezionista, la collezione e il luogo in questo caso, ehm, alla realizzazione dell'ambiente. Eh, è infatti solo a lui e non a suo fratello Ferdinando che si deve attribuire il primo allestimento di, di questo luogo che è cominciato poco prima della sua morte ma si era concluso al momento della morte. Eh, la tradizione rinascimentale degli studioli con la tribuna, ehm, eh sì, eh, si, si può fare un confronto molto evidente e molto paradigmatico appunto, un luogo angusto, quello del primo eh, camerino di Francesco vicino alla sua camera del tesoro, secondo le, più, eh, diciamo, le regole più eh, costanti no, dell'evoluzione dell di questa tipologia ambientale e dall'altra parte... Ehm, un luogo, uno spazio architettonico invece ampio e luminoso, i cui riferimenti dal punto di vista architettonico rinviano a spaziosi prototipi classici, edifici termali, ma anche la Torre dei Venti per la presenza di una rosa dei venti, e anche a prototipi cristiani, i battisteri per la forma ottagonale. La decorazione però della tribuna rimanda invece a un eh, genere diverso e eh, sì, che si trova appunto in rapporto a, questi due, eh, a queste due tendenze, che è il, la grotta, un luogo nascosto della natura, imitato artificialmente dall'uomo. Questo perché? Riassumendo a argomenti che ho trattato in occasioni diverse, eh, noi sappiamo dai documenti che Francesco I chiamava letteralmente questo luogo la spelonca, quindi grotta, antro. Che cosa significa questo se noi lo leggiamo alla luce della decorazione della tribuna? Certi aspetti suoi paradossali, no? come appunto che possono, sono stati anche 
appunto stesso definiti tali come il cielo di conchiglie o altri aspetti della sua decorazione eh, vengono comunque ricomposti in un senso abbastanza eh, compiuto se lo si guarda dal punto di vista eh, appunto della parola spelonca, antro, grotta. L'eccentrico cielo di conchiglie assume una dimensione meno paradossale perché queste sono un esempio tipico della decorazione di antri dall'antichità al Rinascimento, c'è cioè un confronto molto banale tra le, le, le conchiglie immerse nell'intonaco della volta della tribuna e una piccola parte della decorazione coeva della Grotta dei Buontalenti. E, ehm, nel tamburo i, della, della stessa eh, gli oggetti della decorazione sono pure riconducibili ai temi della grotta, vi compaiono infatti queste erme anguiformi, queste figure femminili bellissime eh, che escono da grandi vasa e eh, furono realizzate da, da, eh, dal Boscoli, da questa nutrita schiera di artisti che tutti insieme in questi cinque anni partecipano a, 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 guidati da, proprio dal principe che sempre è eh, ossessivamente presente e li fa rifare, disfare, moltissime cose. E poi oltre alle erme anguiformi, ai delfini, ehm, ovviamente alla presenza dei conchigli anche nel tamburo, anche altri elementi, eh, scille, tritoni e poi c'è purtroppo un, un, una parte fondamentale della decorazione originale che è un fregio che si trovava nello zoccolo in basso e che era stato dipinto da Jacopo Ligozzi e di cui ci resta testimonianza solo in questi beh, piccoli dettagli di un celebre dipinto di Zoffani eh, della metà del Settecento che rappresenta la tribuna all'apice della sua fama come luogo del, del Grand Tour e eh, dove tra i piedi degli astanti vedete si trovano dei pesci eh, e degli uccelli marini perché dalle fonti sappiamo che questo fregio che correva proprio in basso proprio come succede spesso nelle grotte artificiali rinascimentali c'erano pesci, sassi, nicchi e altre cose. Quindi l'aspetto eh, del, architettonico dell'ambiente è molto differente dalla tradizione degli studioli, e questo è chiaro. L'arredo ligneo, tuttavia, della stanza, eh, quindi quelli che eh, tradizionalmente costituivano le teche, i repository, a molti di quegli oggetti di cui abbiamo già parlato durante la giornata, invece fa ricorso a tipologie che costituiscono una tradizione all'interno degli studioli rinascimentali italiani, le cornici a palchetto principalmente e gli armadi e gli studioli al centro alla lettera I e alla lettera E di questa pianta ottagonale ehm, si trovavano due grandi e eh, preziosissimi studioli eh, costruiti dagli ebanisti eh, attivi per Francesco proprio intorno alla stanza della tribuna eh, purtroppo perduti ehm, e mentre intorno alle sei pareti ehm, vedete che eh, correva una eh, cornice estremamente eh, complessa sulla quale era disposta la collezione di piccole cose del, del Granduca. Molte sono le testimonianze che ci dicono, eh, di ambasciatori o di corrispondenti, che il gusto di Francesco per le cose spiccole e egli stesso lo esprime in alcune eh, parti della sua eh, appunto, corrispondenza, dicendo che aveva bisogno di rassettare le mille cosette piccole che si trovava. D'altronde anche nello studio sicuramente nei piccoli armadi c'era spazio per opere molto eh, di dimensioni eh, piuttosto minime. E, mentre eh, abitualmente siamo mh, portati a pensare appunto alla tribuna, a tribù, pensando alle grandi statue, alle venere, alle grandi statue che sono state portate portate lì da Cosimo III alla fine del Seicento e poi agli importantissimi dipinti che la caratterizzano. Tuttavia all'inizio della sua decorazione, quando, quando nasce, la piccola plastica che era disposta su questo grande palchetto molto articolato era sicuramente il fulcro della decorazione. Più dei 30 dipinti pur importantissimi eh, di grandi scuole che vi erano eh, raffigurati la piccola plastica e anche eh, ciò che era contenuto all'interno degli studioli, le collezioni di gemme eh, che, e, e i vasi che perché c'era anche una parte nascosta che non si vede all'interno di due muri c'erano due grandi armadi con i vasi della collezione Medicia che erano eh, totalmente nascosti al pubblico e venivano aperti ovviamente in occasioni particolari. Uh, il palchetto era incardinato uh, nel muro ad un'altezza di circa due metri, allora qui vedete una celebre ehm, 
illustrazione settecentesca dell'articolazione di una delle pareti della tribuna eh, che manca di una parte dell'arredo ligno di cui vi parlerò più tardi eh, c'erano diversi registri nella decorazione quello inferiore con alcune eh, statue poste su sgabelli poi appunto il palchetto e anche che era sorretto da 20 mensole ed esso si interrompeva al centro di ciascuna delle mh, Avanti. Ecco, vedete? Al centro di ciascuna parete si interrompeva per lasciare spazio al sei stato in bronzo di dimensioni abbastanza eh, grandi che provenivano dallo studiolo di Francesco I. Eh, la decorazione era ritmata da elementi lignei che ripetevano in modo identico, eh, si ripetevano in modo identico su tutte le pareti. 20 mensole appunto reggevano il palchetto e poi sopra di esso si trovavano 12 gugliette e 6 archetti. Quella che vi propongo è una ricostruzione basata su delle eh, fonti molto solide, le descrizioni inventariali e ehm, di come e di quali poteva, poteva essere è una ricostruzione molto eh, diciamo, schematica ecco, del, eh, dell'aspetto di queste gugliette e degli archetti che stavano sopra il palchetto eh, però ne abbiamo delle testimonianze abbastanza reiterate negli inventari che vanno dal 1589 fino al 1638 perché già nel 1704 questi, eh, questi eh, arredi lignei che stavano sopra non ci sono più eh, sopra il palchetto non ci sono più eh, all'interno di questa intelaiatura la decorazione aveva una, un andamento molto preciso e le piccole sculture avevano un ruolo molto importante. Questa è una foto un po' divertente, una specie di gruppo di famiglia, eh? un po' ci siamo divertiti col, fo col fotografo a fare una famiglia un po' col mostro, diciamo. E, e, quelle, e, e mostrano tutti gli aspetti più salienti del, delle, delle piccole sculture che sono al centro della mostra. Eh, è ovvero eh, l'antichità di alcune di esse, in questo caso quelle eh, eh, poste in secondo piano, la presenza sempre di, eh, di busti in alabastro che le arricchiscono e eh, l'abbellimento la, anche con eh, preziosi eh, eh, parti di abbigliamento in argento dorato. Quello che vi propongo adesso è un esame abbastanza veloce, spero non troppo noioso, in alcuni casi basato su mie ipotesi, in altri basato su ipotesi che hanno fatto altri, della distribuzione di queste opere e di quali potevano essere i loro compagni sui palchetti della tribuna. Ehm, appunto sappiamo che non tutte le opere descritte nell'inventario del 1589 sono sopravvissute, solo una parte sono state individuate e cercherò appunto di mettere in evidenza gli oggetti ricorrenti, tra i quali le piccole sculture hanno un ruolo molto, molto importante, perché sono poste in punti precisi. Ehm, finora questo, questo, questo aspetto diciamo, non era stato con considerato, ecco, è un primo tentativo di un lavoro che sarà sicuramente molto più lungo, spero. Fin dalle prime testimonianze documentarie, Relative alla destinazione museale eh, della, degli uffizi si ritracciano riferimenti alla piccole sculture. Francesco nel 1581 comincia a capire le potenzialità ai fini museali del secondo piano della, galleria de, della fabbrica degli uffizi e decide di mh, abbellirlo prima con statue, eh, poi con affreschi. Eh, più o meno con, in modo, insomma, più o meno nello stesso momento e anche con le serie di dipinti di uomini illustri provenienti da Palazzo Vecchio e quando oh, ordina, chiede al fratello di mandargli i marmi per fare i petti delle, delle teste che magari o per abbellire, per restaurare le statue antiche, eh, subito già nel 1581 accenna a queste piccole testine anche minori di un palmo perché dice ne ho tante, voglio rassettare queste mille cosette piccole e e, e si esprime sempre con questa urgenza no, che è tipica della figura del collezionista che deve disporre o almeno del suo temperamento di collezionista eh, così appunto come definis lo definisce a volte il Vasari eh, voglioloso eh, l'assemblaggio delle teste antiche in pietra dura con i busti di alabastro ecco, moderni 
e con i raffinatissimi panneggi e acconciature in argento dorato che caratterizza le piccole sculture in pietra dura della collezione di Francesco si inserisce coerentemente nel contesto di sperimentazione tecnica e formale che caratterizza la decorazione della tribuna che è sempre verso un estremo virtuosistico formale. Tutto ciò che viene realizzato, le tecniche utilizzate per la decorazione per esempio eh, della ehm, della cupola, no? eh, con questa lacca dorata che pian piano dal rosso vira verso l'oro al centro, oppure le tecniche eh, sono estremamente rare, sono sperimentali, sperimentali sono le, le erme anguiformi realizzate con oro eh, su, direttamente sulla pietra e, e così via. Ecco. E, lo stesso appunto questo senso di sperimentazione, di appropriazione di, anche di tecniche eh, diverse si ritrova anche nelle piccole sculture e, ehm, di cui appunto eh, vi do ora un, un esempio eh, della loro collocazione. Quelle più piccole eh, si trovavano, erano disposte sulle mensole che erano circa una ventina e eh, le mensole erano scandite pure appunto in modo del tutto simmetrico, per cui eh, nella nicchia superiore si trovava una piccola scultura, in, nella nicchia inferiore si trovava un bronzetto di solito antico, che vedete rappresentato lì in due esempi, un ehm, lanternario e un bronzetto che porta, un, un erote che porta dei, dei pomi, ai lati piccoli contenitori in pietra dura e... e nella parte inferiore erano attaccati eh, 12, 20 eh, ritrattini di belle donne della eh, corte medicea. E questi sono alcuni esempi delle piccole sculture che erano disposte nelle mensole. Va bene? E sono conservate quasi tutte, ne mancano due. Queste sono, sono dell'epoca di Francesco. E, eh, appunto sono individuabili ancora oggi nelle nostre collezioni e eh, riconducibili con buona approssimazione alle descrizioni degli inventari, cioè si può dire a quale mensola stava una o stava l'altra sostanzialmente. Erano decorate appunto con panneggi d'argento dorate e composte da teste antiche o moderne, qui principalmente moderne, in queste qui proprio più piccole, e di colore affine o diverso appunto dal busto in modo da creare un raffinatissimo gioco cromatico. Eh, adesso eh, vi presento una carrellata delle sei pareti con alcuni elementi ricorrenti oltre alle piccole sculture in pietra dura che cosa a, le, le accompagnava in questa mh, ecco, questo è di nuovo eh, l'ottagono io parto dalla parete a destra che è H e percorro le, eh, le sei pareti restanti e, e questa è la parete d'ingresso ora voi vi chiedo uno sforzo di immaginazione perché là dove vedete vuoto tra un oggetto e l'altro era pieno di altre cose che magari non sono state individuate, che sono descritte, che aspettano ancora eh, una puntuale individuazione e eh, vi chiedo anche uno sforzo perché le, le, le immagini che ho messo su queste, in queste figure non sono in scala e quindi questo si capisce e, per cui eh, eh, cercherò di, eh, in questo percorso di eh, sottolineare certi aspetti eh, che mi sembrano particolarmente significativi. Nella parete d'ingresso eh, in apertura si trovavano due, busti, eh, due teste antiche montate su busti in marmi policromi e... Ehm, e insieme a loro altre, altre, altre opere che non si, non si vedono nella mia ricostruzione non sono state individuate e poi seguivano due oggetti eh, molto eh, singolari credo per le collezioni italiane ehm, che eh, erano presenti su tutte le pareti della tribuna ovvero i monti di miniera che sono tipici delle collezioni asburgiche delle collezioni tedesche e che evidentemente Francesco aveva, si era procurato grazie ai suoi contatti con i suoi parenti, insomma, cognati, zii, e cugini e nipoti eh, sparsi in tutta Europa. Ehm, eh, ai lati delle due, eh, ai due angoli, 
si trovavano delle sculture eh, più alte delle altre, tutte sculture in marmo, eh, che sono individuabili grazie fortunatamente alle molte testimonianze visive, soprattutto settecentesche, eh, che si conservano della tribuna, ed erano queste sculture, in, nel caso della parete d'ingresso, erano due gruppi di lotta, due gruppi, due Ercoli in lotta, Ercole e il Leone e Ercole e Lica, e questi eh, messi agli angoli erano alti tutti un braccio, quindi erano 58 centimetri e costituivano circa l'opera più alte in questa sequenza e l'Ercole il Leone è stato ritrovato da, eh, individuato da Anna Maria Massinelli in un'opera oggi conservata al, uh, all'Ermitage di San Pietroburgo. Questi sono degli esempi di Monti di Miniera, è un tema che sicuramente poteva uh, affascinare la mente di, di Francesco che era così eh, appunto eh, incline alla sperimentazione in tutti gli ambiti della materia, specialmente nel vetro e nell'alchimia. E, ehm, e eh, comunque... Sotto il palchetto c'erano molti oggetti ricorrenti, tra questi i più significativi, forse che possiamo evidenziare in questo momento, sono di nuovo due grandi conchiglie che si trovano spesso, eh, quasi in tutte le pareti, al centro, e in questo caso quindi riprendono la conchiglia della volta e il tema marino del fregio, e che erano però conchiglie particolari, cioè erano appunto grandi conchiglioni di madreperla con all'interno delle altre conchezioni per, per l'acee e tutte montate ovviamente in modo molto fastoso con eh, abbellimenti di, ehm, di argento e d'oro. Ecco, proseguendo in questa breve carrellata della presenza eh, delle opere all'interno delle, delle, delle pareti, ehm, Incontriamo appunto per la prima volta a destra dell'ingresso nella parete eh, che io chiamo H e che è, eh, ha al, al suo al centro la, a, la presenza della statua di Giunone eh, che è coronata come vedete dall'archetto, sopra gli archetti, sopra ciascun archetto erano poste sei eh, fatiche d'Ercole in argento eh, del Giambologna che oggi sono perdute, se ne conoscono delle repliche, mentre invece eh, sopra ciascuna delle dodici piramidine che erano disposte in questo allestimento ehm, si trovavano delle sculturine in bronzo, tutte presumibilmente antiche, alte eh, all'incirca eh, mezzo braccio, avevano tutte all'incirca la stessa altezza e si ripeteva continuamente la serie di oggetti disposta all'interno delle piramidine, come abbiamo visto nelle mensole c'erano una statuina, un bronzetto e un quadretto nelle piramidine, c'era un'altra serie con quattro piccoli bronzetti, tutti antichi, il bronzo è assolutamente preponderante in questa, in questa decorazione, e altri piccoli contenitori e poi la scultura a, apicale. Quindi sempre il rapporto metallo, pietra dura è eh, quindi è ricorrente. Ehm, in modo eh, appunto eh, molto forte. Il numero di oggetti poi, eh, quindi qui vedete tutto un po' vuoto, ma vi ripeto con la fantasia dovete riempire di oggetti meravigliosi quegli, quegli spazi, e il numero di oggetti tra l'archetto e le piramidine di solito variava tra i 4 o 5, eh, quindi ehm, c'erano circa eh, quindi, eh, massimo 20 oggetti per eh, mensola. Ehm, <coughs> Eh, anche sugli archetti poi, oltre che nelle piramidine, si trovava sempre più, mh, mh, quasi continuamente la stessa serie di oggetti, in particolare due piccoli bronzetti ai gradini inferiori e, ed erano tutti coronati dalle sei, eh, da una delle sei fatiche in, er, in argento del Giambologna. Tra, quel, tra le opere presenti in questa parete mi piace eh, farvi notare appunto una delle piccole sculture, una mora eh, che sta a, ornava appunto la, la, la mensola, la nicchia superiore della mensola, è stata riconosciuta anche la venere eh, che si trovava all'estremità della parete, come pure una piccola scultura interpretata come la Oconte eh, si trovava al, eh, su uno dei gradini dell'archetto, mentre invece il nostro, diciamo, uno dei protagonisti veri della eh, collezione di piccole sculture preziose eh, del tesoro era pure collocato all'interno oh, di questo palchetto. Um, le piccole sculture nella tribuna erano circa una trentina, eh, di queste con una buona eh, 
probabilità, grazie agli studi effettuati in questa occasione, si è potuto riconoscerne circa 15 come antiche e, eh, e se ne conservano eh, la maggior parte, cioè circa, se non sbaglio, appunto 28, non mi ricordo bene ora eh, i numeri. Nel, eh, diversamente dalle altre, che, dalle altre pareti che vedremo dopo, la prima, a destra dell'ingresso, non aveva i lati dell'archetto dell due piccole sculture preziose, bensì due bronzetti, probabilmente perché qui c'erano delle mancanze nella collezione, Francesco non era riuscito, si vede, ad averne abbastanza per popolare in modo proprio ehm, armonico tutta la sua, uh, la sua camera delle meraviglie. Segue ancora la parete G con la, con la statua di Vulcano al centro e vedete di nuovo le piccole sculture eh, che caratterizzavano le mensole che in questo caso sono in granato. Eh, sono state riconosciute poi due tazze in lapislazzoli che ornavano l'archetto e eh, le due piccole sculture preziose, una antica e una moderna ai lati dell'archetto circondate da due monti di miniera, uno profano e uno sacro cui seguivano anche una statua in, in marmo e una in bronzo eh, prima delle guglie e ehm, qui ecco, queste sono una delle, una delle coppie di eh, piccole sculture preziose che mostrano appunto tutte le, le loro caratteristiche ehm, quindi la piccola la testa in cristallo di rocca antica che presentava ovviamente dei fori quindi era una testa che probabilmente appunto eh, portava una corona è stata trasformata in una divinità in Apollo non solo grazie appunto all'inserimento della corona ma anche grazie alla caratterizzazione dell'abbigliamento che presenta eh, tutte fiammelle No, nel, nel, nel bellissimo panneggio, mentre l'altra è uno, un po' eh, insomma, eh, un satiro che è un esperimento perché è il materiale che finge il lapislazzo in realtà è un vetro e quindi è proprio una di quelle sperimentazioni tipiche della cultura, del, e del, insomma, del, la cultura artistica che eh, circondava il eh, protagonista. Segue ancora la. la mm, la prossima parete con la statua di Venere che era circondata da una parte da, appunto dalla mora in agata perché oltre alle sculture, alle teste antiche assemblate su busti moderni Francesco fa intagliare anche sculturine eh, più grandi dagli, dagli intagliatori in pietre dure attivi presso le sue botteghe come eh, Giorgio Gaffurri, questo è eh, sicuramente attribuito, ce lo dice l'inventario e poi sono stati identificati eh, ipoteticamente anche eh, alcuni bronzi delle guglie che, che si trovavano in posizione apicale sopra le gugliette tra cui eh, è appunto questo l'are del museo archeologico e ricorrono intorno a Venere significativamente ancora le due grandi conchiglie. Procedo in questa eh, un po' in questo diciamo ehm, Elenco ancora eh, dimostrando la, la posizione di due eh, piccole sculture della collezione, le rote su Delfino e il babbuino eh, che si trovavano sull'archetto e di nuovo vedete le piccole sculture che erano all'interno delle mensole, il monte di miniera da una parte, le piccole sculture invece alla base dell'archetto e in questo caso quei due eh, strani segni intorno alla statua di Borea eh, indicano un ciottolo, un ciottolo d'ambra e una pepita d'oro. Queste sono le piccole sculture che stavano ai lati di, 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 dell'archetto che eh, sormontava la, la statua di Borea e Passiamo velocemente verso la fine, siamo sulla parete di Anfitrite eh, dove ritroviamo ancora la stessa sequenza ed è esattamente la sequenza simmetrica a quella che si trova nella parete opposta, quindi intorno all'archetto due piccole sculture, due monti di miniera e poi dovete immaginare lì non c'è spazio, due sculture in marmo e due in bronzo e seguiva anche una eh, identica articolazione degli oggetti successivi non mi dilungo molto sulle eh, posizioni, poi è stato individuato già da tempo questo, eh, o perlomeno ipotizzato che questo bacco eh, potesse essere quello che, ehm, un bacco dell'archeologico potesse essere posto sopra una delle gugliette di questa parete e queste sono le due, 
eh, piccole teste in cristallo di rocca eh, addobbate appunto eh, come eh, secondo i, i, il gusto di questo luogo e una di queste due probabilmente apparteneva già a Cosimo I perché si sa che nella sua collezione c'era una testa in cristallo di rocca. Siamo quasi alla fine della, della carrellata con la parete di Apollo circondata da eh, due divinità egizie, Osiri de Canopo e Giove Serapide e le due piccole sculture nelle mensole sempre con questo gioco cromatico molto accentuato e una venere che culminava eh, nella eh, guglietta di destra. In questa parete era eh, collocato anche in fondo vicino all'Ercole che è eh, l'Ercole che abbiamo visto dell'Ercole e Leone e il globo di Ambrogio Maggiore eh, che ovviamente faceva la sua bella figura in mezzo ai meraviglia di Francesco I. E termino con questa immagine che costituisce la base per la ricostruzione che abbiamo tentato in mostra di una delle pareti nell'aspetto settecentesco. E desidero puntare l'attenzione ancora su questo multiforme di spiegamento di tecniche artistiche che è presente nella decorazione della tribuna e che è caratterizzato da un'estrema tensione virtuosistica. Il caleidoscopico insieme dei oggetti appartenenti al Granduca era distribuito sullo scaffale in modo da creare un'intelaiatura fittissima di rapporti, interconnessioni e rimandi incrociati tra i suoi componenti, che erano scanditi ripetutamente con modalità espositive differenti, così da ricordare la struttura di un contrappunto musicale in cui i temi principali sono continuamente variati e riproposti in modi diversi per sondarne tutte le possibilità espressive. In questo contrappunto tridimensionale le piccole sculture preziose costituivano una nota cromatica ricorrente e distinta che contribuiva a cadenzare ritmicamente la musica visiva delle opere disposte sopra il palchetto e sotto. Vi ringrazio. Grazie davvero così ci si rende conto della follia di questo luogo, di questa follia in positivo. Eh, insomma, ci sono molte domande, ma forse le possiamo fare dopo, adesso la pausa. Eh, va bene.